everybody, and welcome to 372 Pages We'll Never Get Back. I am Connor Lestoka, joined by Mike Nelson. Mike, we're reading Gump and Co., Gump and Company, and we are past the halfway mark now. How do you, uh, how, how's it going for you? Uh, ass, Connor. Ass is all I have to say. <laughs> That's pretty it's, much every other word, so I might as well open the podcast with it. Yes, absolutely. It's, it's, it's full of asses, assing around. Uh, kicking people in their big old asses, uh, door 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 jams, hitting you in the ass. It's as assy as it can get, I would say. And can I just say from the start, I'm done with bidness. I'm really <laughs> not happy when every time I read that word in everyone's mouth. It's it comes I up a lot like for how often you know he's actually engaging in bidness. But yes. uh, you know, even even when the bidness is is hog farming or something like that, it it, it, it does get mighty tiresome. <laughs> It's grating, but uh, yeah, but I'm happy to be uh, past the halfway mark. Run, Forest, run, I would say, and I don't, I don't even know what that means, but I'm going to say it. Well, we have uh, everything to, uh, to share with everybody today. We have dumb sentences of the week. We have some, some emails, and we have, uh, of course, real or fanfic, which has proven to be uh, qu- quite fun, if not super difficult for you, I think, that this, uh, this iteration of the book. Uh, didn't I? I thought last week was fairly triumphant. Yeah, or am I was, hovering at the fifty percent mark? I think like that was normal. a. You might have had four out of five last week, and, and maybe three out of five before. So your your average continues to tick up. Okay. Uh, <laughs> much like the the penny stocks and junk bonds sold by Michael Milken in the nineteen eighties. Um, to, uh, to, yep, and his pal Mike Mulligan. For sure, yes, steam shovel owner. That's. I had to look that one up, but we'll get to that. Yes. Um, well, maybe maybe I'll start this just because we have we have uh, you know leaned into this pretty heavily, but we got a, a major revelation from a listener this week. Uh, oh, Dan good. Dan wrote in, and he, okay. he said, "I wanted to let you know that there is no record of Larry King reading Gump and Cump." Well, what do you mean? He says, "If you look carefully at the link in the Wikipedia reference." It uh, directs to a page on Goodreads, noting that Gumpany is the long-awaited sequel to the book hailed by Larry King as the funniest novel I have ever read. What? So the the, the Wikipedia, I guess, used the uh, th- that pull quote accidentally about Larry King liking the first book, um, and just you know mentioned that for this book. I don't think that absolves him of anything, you know. It's, no, it's is not, that are you sure that's only the Wikipedia? I swear, I, I feel like I've seen it on a book jacket or something. Uh, I mean, so well, well, we'll get to that. But no, I think I think it's I think it's correct. I think he he praised the first one, and you know, it's like how on uh, you know Ready Player Two they had just praise for Ready Player One on the cover type of thing. Sure, sure, okay. <laughs> but I mean, it doesn't absolve him of anything because that means that Larry King was still doing the the Larry King chortling at the adventures of Forrest wrestling in a diaper with the turd. <laughs> Yes, that's you know, true. From everything that we gathered, there was not a huge drop off in quality between these two books. So I don't think hey, it's the hang gotcha. On, hang but... on, guys. I, I wasn't laughing at that particular. With the hog farming, did not <laughs> right. find that funny. <laughs> so I don't think it's the big gotcha that uh, that Dan feared. But um, I, I, I noted one of the other. Um, what do you call them? Excerpts or praise excerpts in the in the be- beginning of the paperback was from a guy named. Uh, Kinky Friedman. Yeah, Kinky Friedman. Who's He's, like a country singer, comedian, sure. s- writer, or something. <laughs> sure. Back when you could be that sort of hyphenate. Um, I, I never read him. I didn't know anything about him before this, but that was my takeaway. Just sort of a novelty, novelty act. But he says uh, his his review is Groom is especially commended for popularizing the authentic Southern pronunciation of the word shrimp. This is an important and humorous detail that is not lost upon upon those of us who still believe we love the South. And this, to me, is like when when Lauren used to review restaurants for a living and didn't care for the restaurant, so would focus on like a chandelier, <laughs> you know, or like a, yes. a, the the layout of the restaurant type of thing. You find find something like a compliment sandwich to uh, to pay attention to. But he goes well. on. The protagonist, there's also several ellipses in this quote. <laughs> okay, uh, the protagonist ellipses provides, in quotes, suggesting that wasn't the actual word, the more sophisticated reader with many vital insights into the human condition, and every reader is more sophisticated than Forrest Gump, ellipses. Gump and Co. is, as Larry King might say, quote, a funny read. 
<laughs> Boy, <laughs> that is torturing the data to get the uh, result you want. Yeah. I mean, is that uh, is that a, a known catchphrase of Larry King? Like, do you really have to name drop him there to get across the term a funny read? <laughs> wow. So, and, he, and so... So that, that's a weird coincidence if uh, if Larry King was not into Gump and Company, but but did like the first one. That is amazing. And, you know, you're pulling out something to praise it, a la Kinky Friedman there. Reminds me of, we've talked about it before, when you have to go and see your friends perform in something that you don't want to see. <laughs> when yeah. you do that very thing, it's like, I I can't lie. I'm so bad at... Because I would just I would break out in a like a weird rictus smile if I was like you were you were really great I really liked everything about it. <laughs> yeah. So then you have to find the thing that you actually like, and so you, and it's like you're just combing through it, like mm-hmm. you know that third song. That, oh, there was so much <laughs> energy to that. You know? yeah. This so part you where you smear it. Jello on yourself uh, while reciting the Declaration of Independence. That, that you, you, I felt that. Yes. <sighs> Ah, uh, so we've all had that instinct. So thank you, Kinky. So yeah, that he he praised the pronunciation of shrimp, and that made it into the book uh, from his <laughs> review in the Washington Post. So uh, um, wow, um, that's uh, that's the level of praise we're dealing with. So you know, Larry King, fan of the first one, his views on the second one, uh, not not certain, but I think we got to treat it like one of those movies, like the you know the when Twilight made its uh, its final movie, two separate movies, or Harry Potter. You know, they're all Kill Bill. They're all one movie. So if you like the first one and not the second one, I, I think it's it's safe to say that the the same praise applies. Yeah, you can't do the uh, the dodges that the Ready Player Two people were doing. It's like, uh, wow, what happened? The first one is so great. <laughs> right, like, oh, exactly. Come on, yes. you cannot do that. <laughs> Well, uh, we should get into it and, and explore this book that Kinky Friedman and Larry King both loved. Right. Uh, we, we left off where Forrest had been in a, a variety of mishaps, such as the Iran-Contra scandal. He had traveled to meet Ayatollah Khomeini. He had farmed hogs and powered a city briefly by their excrement. Um, he had invented new coke. And the last thing he had done was performed at uh, Jim Baker's ill-fated... Uh, religious theme park as Goliath, who wore a diaper and uh, acted, I think in his own words, like a big asshole. (laughs) Well, yeah, wearing a diaper, you know you're going to get some ass involved, of course. Absolutely, yes. It does seem like he's he's frequently either putting on diapers or observing other people in diapers, so that's another uh, another thing that tied them both together and most assuredly made Larry King like this one just as much. Yes, and he goes Larry goes, "Wait, well, hold on. There's a diaper in this one also." <laughs> yeah. Why did you say so, Kinky? <laughs> I'll, I'll read it, sure. <laughs> Matthew Fox up next. <laughs> um, so chapter eight uh, ends with him having uh, caused the dissolution of uh, Jim Baker's theme park. Another riot ensued. Jim Baker went to prison. And the way that this one started off, he says, <laughs> in one of the most tortured and sentences that takes you on quite a journey, he says, me, comma, however, comma, it looks like, comma, will be returning to jail also, comma, but that was not to be. <laughs> uh, before that he commits uh, a crime i think of of uh, writing mm-hmm. is one thing led to another wow. and in the end he gone on to jail his Seth. <laughs> um I, first of all isn't that a we've had that in other bad books where you know y- yada yada it exactly yes uh but it's also i believe a famous uh brian regan uh, talk about making fun of your own writing. When he was a kid, he he wrote like a paper. Okay, and he, it was like about the the uh, Germany starting World War II. <laughs> one thing led to another, and suddenly they bombed for a lot. That's incredible. The teacher was like, "You cannot just say one thing led to another." <laughs> yeah, I mean, I you know, I suppose that it's a simpleton telling the story, but you know that that doesn't excuse you know he invented other. Uh, expressions like life is like a box of chocolates in the other book. So it doesn't give you an excuse to just use well-trod cliches in order yeah, to yeah. Uh, yeah, get, get around writing a paragraph. Yes. yes. <laughs> uh, oh, what did he say? Uh, so he may, he goes on to meet, I think this is the third uh, predatory Pinocchio fox that we've encountered yes. in here. Yeah. 
Yeah, he, he B- which, bow tie tugging, uh, you know, shaking his change in his pocket. Uh, yeah, pulling, you know, pocket watch kind of guy. Suit yes. with suspenders and big flashy teeth and spit shined shoes. It says so. It is essentially like a uh, a fox who would be outside of a a swing concert or something. Yes. I believe on the on the cover of Big Bad Voodoo Daddy's Daddy's album, yes. they had a fox doing just that, flipping a, a silver dollar. It's the Brian Setzer Orchestra. Would have, yes. Uh, yes. <laughs> What if it was the Brian Regan Orchestra? It might go, I don't know. Uh, I think it would go something <laughs> like this. Uh, and then it, 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 that guy turns out to be Ivan Bozowski. I, I believe it's Boski. Okay. and just, whatever, just, That's just from memory. I did not look it up, so I could be wrong, but I think it's just Boski. Can you give us the rundown of what his actual deal was um, for those of us who didn't read about him in Bloom County? I think it was just the entire... Insider trading the the one of the I don't know the first the second time that uh, you know the the too big to fail just insider trading and uh, general scumminess from Wall Street. Got yeah, so he's a Wolf of Wall Street guy or yes, uh, heart Gordon of the Gecko 80s. type of guy. Correct. Okay. Yes, and for whatever reason, Forrest Gump pronounces his name, and then the other guy, the other Wall Street guy, he uses them where he wouldn't. I mean, I guess. Have there been real people's names you see? Yeah, sure. Oliver North. He 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 screws up these guys' names, maybe for some sort of legal reason or something. Oh, do you think that it, I never checked the spelling? Is this the spelling different than the actual Boski? Oh, I think so. I I I've been, I think I because it was mentioned in the beginning. Yeah. So this says Bozowski, and it's B O E S K. Oh, he's just. I, I didn't even get that he's just making the really, really dumb joke of calling him Bozo. Bozo, yes. That's right. it? Yes. Ah. <laughs> and I other... thought it was just a mis. I don't know. Okay. Yeah. So he is calling him Bozowski. Okay, got it. Yeah. Bo- Bozowski, I guess. <laughs> Bozowski hands him a uh, copy of the Wall Street Journal, which has the headline as the. The running joke is Stooge shuts down important economic theme park. Um, it's sort of, I don't know if there's satire in here because it taught, is it a, uh, uh, economic opportunities for thousands of hardworking American citizens. But it says in his role as the giant Goliath Gump, who is said to be a large figured man, the Wall Street Journal just must not have a, a good sports department at this time of year because you would not need to tell Anybody that the the reigning uh, NFL leading wide receiver was a large figured man, he's it's well known. <laughs> right. He, in fact, um, in one of those little video things where they kind of stand still or they toss the ball back and forth mm-hmm. between their hands and then yeah, they yep. give their stats. Um, yep. So that's easily checkable. <laughs> yes. <laughs> as he smiles and points at the camera. Yeah, holds the ball towards the camera. Yes. Uh, and then it's he, Ivan essentially says that he appreciated what uh, Forrest had done, taken the hit for Oliver North, and asks him to come work for him buying uh, and selling stocks. And he says, I'm starting a new division in my company in New York called the Division of Insider Trading. And I want you to be its president. So it's essentially like... I've said it was just like a, a terrible political cartoon where that's just labeled on the desk of what they're doing. Yes. <laughs> uh, yeah, and I don't really get the, um, you know, everyone who is these these cartoon foxes, it doesn't quite fit the uh, the image. I, I believe Ivan, uh, I'm going to call him Bosky. Bozo. sure. Yeah. Yes, Ivan Bosky. <laughs> Oh, Bozo. Oh, God, that's terrible. <laughs> anyway, uh, it's just sort of was a bland figure. I think that that was part of the, the thing. Okay. And so, like, making him a, say you, <laughs> I don't think they were, uh, these guys generally weren't cartoon wolves. So it is, it's a little strange uh, nice. that he puts this on everyone. But yes, also making it on the nose is like, come on. <laughs> Wait, what, you wouldn't get to the insider trading stuff. Right. I'm trying to think what would be a good analog to it of like introducing a character. Yeah, I don't remember much about him, but oh, the impeachment guy. And like, right. how'd you like to come to my impeachment trial? Right. <laughs> how'd you like to go commit some war crimes, Forrest? <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> but he does recruit him to uh to to go to New York, where we get I mean, I think it was a uh you know, he gets a sort of going to New York montage, like uh, mm-hmm. uh, uh, looking around up at the up at the skyscrapers and taxis honking type of thing. But we get, among the most artful of these ever, he says, I had the immediate impression that I was in an anthill where all the ants were half crazy. 
So that's the Big Apple, baby. That's <laughs> <laughs> of all the great things that have ever been written about the biggest city in the country. That's you know, that, I think that's poetry. Well, I'd also like to. I, I don't want the history of this to to pass us by. And so, for people who are wondering, and obviously most people are probably younger, they don't remember Ivan Bozozowski. <laughs> um, here's what he did. He lays it out pretty simply here. Uh, this is quoting him in the book. We buy and sell shit. Stuff on paper, actually. Bonds, stocks, business, whatever. We don't buy anything, and we don't buy and sell anything, really. But when we get through talking on the phones and shuffling all the papers, we wind up with a shit pot of our money of money in our pockets. Uh, <laughs> and then the technique. Meanness, dirty tricks and stuff. Peeking over people's shoulders, going behind their backs, picking their pockets. It's a jungle out there, Gump. And right now, I am the big tiger. So that is... Uh, Probably direct quotes from Mr. Bozo Yes, himself, yes. I, I the slick talk of a, of a Wall Street insider. <laughs> yes. Shit pots of money. So <laughs> ass, ass adjacent, I would yes, say. Yes. I mean, you know, I, I think you, you know, just during your, your early read of this section, we're just like the ass just keeps coming. So it's, <laughs> it's worth calling out because it does seem to be a, a pretty big <laughs> running theme. It really is. He's obsessed. Um, he says uh, that... He's going to have to like have Forrest um, get in good with people at these big companies so that he'll be able to get tips as to like, you know, when they're going uh, public, when they're going to sell, when they're going to make a big announcement so you can do the insider trading. And Forrest is like, how do you how do you make friends with these people? Simple. Just hang around the Harvard or Yale clubs or the racket club or any number of places where these morons do their thing. Buy them a a bunch of drinks, play dumb. Take him to dinner, get them a girl, kiss their asses, whatever it takes. <laughs> so, he's, so, so this is as Forrest enters his pimp phase as he's uh, procuring uh, procuring girls for uh, Harvard and Yale graduates at the racket club. And and why did he hire this um, uh, ex you know football star like mm-hmm. superstar? Right, because he was you know he hired him because he met him immediately after you know shutting down the jim baker theme park but he said the reason i like the cut of your jib basically because you didn't rat out that ollie north character yes so it's like forget the whole chapter that just came before <laughs> here's the reason sure right yes. you do seem like an idiot as you ran around in a goliath diaper or whatever but <laughs> however i'm putting you at the head of this thing yeah uh it it doesn't quite scan for i me. guess it's the mafia code you know where you're just as long as you keep your mouth shut and serve your time you can people can trust you even it you know though you did go to prison so that means you got caught doing whatever you were doing which means you know you you probably could have done it better right right but uh, if, the book, we, if the rest of the book had just involved forrest being like procuring uh prostitutes for for people at these clubs and turned out that he was good at it and liked the work and that was how the back half of the book went i i would forgive the entire rest of the journey if that's right how he, if that's how he ran this character into the ground yes uh luckily though and happily he brings him to show him his new office and uh uh he sees the statue of liberty from the in the distance it's you know it's beautiful and Gump, of course, says, nice view. Nice view, my ass, says Ivan. This shit costs $200,000 a square foot. So there he is again. I yeah. can't help himself. It's incredible. Well, you know, it's uh, you hopefully have a big shit pot if this shit is so expensive and abundant here. And then yes. it keeps going because Forrest says, where's the bathroom? And he says, uh, you know, you got a private bathroom. Is that is that what you're asking? And he just says, nope, I got to pee. At this, Ivan jumps back a little. Well, that is a rather straightforward way of putting it, I must say. You were just asking him to 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 pimp people out for eye bankers. Like <laughs> this is where his moral compass is drawn. I, I also thought that very strange. Is like you know who this person is. You've spent a lot of time with him. Then he says something I think rather tame, like "I got a pee," mm-hmm. and he jumps back like. Again, like he's W.C. Fields, like doing a take for Mr. <laughs> Muckle or something. What is what I can trying to imagine what he's doing, like, yeah, hands in the air, like tipping his straw boater up and down. Wow, right. that's a rather, yeah, that's quite a way to put it there, Mr. Gump. Gump's a wildly attractive secretary, Mrs. Hudgens, has a, uh, you know, a monocle fall out into her drink out of her eye as she gasps. <laughs> I don't know. 
But he says, he, then he says, you know, or his, he meets the secretary and she says, shows him his desk and says, welcome to the insider trading division of Bozowski Enterprises, which is, I, we've had people in movies at, at Rift Tracks where it's like essentially, you know, Evil Co. or, you know, you know Division of Crimes, like, uh, yeah. you know, Felony Corp. <laughs> like type of things. Right. <laughs> and that's essentially, uh, it's never a good thing when something comes up that obvious and blatant. It usually means your movie is fairly artless and on the nose. And so that's what's happening here. <laughs> Yeah, it came up before. What was Terry Silver's? Uh, oh, Dyna- Dynatox. Dynatox. <laughs> they were dumping <laughs> toxic waste. Yes. That was all they existed to do. So, <laughs> yeah, that's uh, that's what's happening here, I guess. Um, I confess I don't understand. So Miss Hudgens is, you know, she's Jessica Rabbit or whatever. Yep, she's Joan from <clears throat> Mad Men. Right. She takes him to... I don't get this joke. I wonder if you do. Because now... I'm looking for every kind of um, football coach or dad, dad at a party after he's had, you know, two old fashions jokes. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And uh, he goes to get a suit and he goes to Mr. Squeegees. Yeah. Um, who's a short, fat guy with a Hitler looking mustache and a bald head. Is there a, is there a joke I'm missing? Here? Uh, you know, I wondered that, too, because, you know, New York was sort of famous for, I feel like, in the. In the '80s, like Times Square, where there would be like squeegee guys. Yeah, you know that's guys what that I like, don't understand. But the people who sell you suits, I assume, would be. Come on, you got to have a cliche for that. And I didn't picture someone named Mister Squeegee, <laughs> so I'm just not getting the joke. And it's again, it's me. It's no, yeah, no. It's probably there. It's probably a um, a, a New York joke from the from the '80s that was you know Johnny Carson made fun of for a week, and then the rest of the world moved on and. <laughs> Winston Groom called it back for for Gump and Co. Okay, <laughs> they can't they can't all be winners, I guess. You can't. Uh, uh, yeah, like we were t- you you mentioned, we didn't start the fire before we started the call. Like they can't all be, uh, you know, the, the 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 rock and roller cola wars made it into that <laughs> made it into that song because that was probably like the last thing he saw on TV right before he he finished writing the song. But that didn't it always really made me laugh. <laughs> yeah, that was the thing that he couldn't take it anymore. <laughs> rock and roller cola wars. I can't take this anymore. <laughs> You were talking about AIDS crack and Bernie Getz just like two Uh, verses ago. A president was assassinated, yeah, just 45 very catchy seconds of song uh, ago. Wow, okay. That's what pushed him over the edge. All right. So, Mr. Boski, uh, I should note um, the return of the Cheshire Grin. Yeah. Who? Yep, that was a... uh, hmm. (laughs) <laughs> a, it was just it a moment you know it's uh as we weave these tangled webs through these books it was good to have just another thread on our yarn wall uh yeah we get two of them i think but yeah it's uh and mike mulligan he mike mulligan by the way <laughs> which yes. we have to talk about he be grinning like a cheshire cat um i didn't look it up is there was mike mulligan i assume he's a real well, guy Michael from Milken, the time right i mean that's that's what that is he was the uh junk bond guy Right, but isn't there an actual appearance of Mike, or am I mixing up real and fanfic? And this? Uh, uh, I thought in the future there is an actual Michael Milken. Uh, I, I think we might have just read a passage from this, and so we might have talked about how. Uh, I, okay, I, I don't remember, but there is Michael Mulligan. He's the, the beloved children's book where he had the steam shovel that uh, you know you know rescued a town or something. Okay, so see, I have to, this is my problem, I have to think even dumber. So when he's misspelling someone as Bozo, he's actually meaning to just call him Bozo. Uh-huh. And, when, and when he's saying Mike Milken, he's actually, he just says another character. Okay, yes, I think uh, I've cracked the code. I just didn't, I was have honestly you? like... <laughs> the, the code is that this guy was like, uh, you know, you, you got to write this book or else they're going to like the rights are going to transfer or something like that fantastic four movie that Roger Corman made. So like get it done in three weeks, then you can go party okay. with Larry at Margaritaville. Okay. So, all right. So that's, that's a strange insult to call him Mike, to call Mike Milken, Mike Mulligan. I don't think that Milken was very stung by this. I have to say, <laughs> I don't think he would like, what did he call me? Uh, he, you know, he called me the beloved steam shovel owning guy from the children's book. Unless it was a That's slam on a, his golf game or something. That, that was, maybe uh, it could be. I don't know. <laughs> uh, we, we, she, this comes up later, but she does, uh, give, uh, Forrest, um, his apartment, like they've rented it out for him, which is, uh, a nice lady owns it named Leona. And I think it was called, I think it's the Helmsley palace. 
So this was another one that was I was like, I don't think this woman raided in Bloom County, but she definitely showed up in a Far Side cartoon, which is pretty much the only way that I knew her. Yeah. I mean, you, you, you've heard of the Queen of Mean, but there's a Far Side where Leona Helmsley is coming down to check on her uh, houses being her houses uh, renovations that are being done by the Three Stooges. So that was, <laughs> okay. uh, that was what I always knew her as. <laughs> Uh, but again, a, a strange thing. Like, why doesn't he just call her Hell? You know, put the the word Hell in her name. You know, like, right. huh? <laughs> like, what, what he calls him Mike Milk and Mike Mulligan. Why does he just call it? He calls her. It's Leona Helmsley. She's just there. I just don't get the the strange. I guess he's scared of some people, but not of others. Yeah, I, maybe. Yeah, right. But he does say that Mike Milligan, Mike Mulligan, whatever, Michael Milken. Uh, it says a limo took us to a restaurant called the Four Seasons, and we are showed to a table where there's a tall, skinny guy in a suit with a wolfish look on his face. So it's just, uh, <laughs> just saying it outright at this point in time. Mm. And I did, uh, I did think that the that the Four Seasons, uh, if there was anything that would realistically fit, you know, Forrest Gump, um, if there was a third one, the Four Seasons total landscaping incident would be, you know, that's that's sort of just textbook of what has happened in this book so far. <laughs> Wait, is that a real thing? The force. Come on. What? <laughs> the Four Seasons total landscaping incident. I don't know what that there is. There was a. It was. I think it was maybe three. It was like a week after the 2020 election, and Rudy Giuliani called a uh, a, a press conference that uh, took place at a off ramp place in Philadelphia. I visited it actually. It was next to a, uh, a adult bookstore and it was an establishment called four seasons, total landscaping. And that was where okay. they were having this press conference. And it was pretty much widely understood that this was not a place to have the president's attorney, have a, <laughs> have a uh, press conference, you know, disputing uh, results of the election. And so it was widely believed that it had been intended to be at the four seasons hotel, 10 miles away in Philadelphia. And, uh, wires were crossed during the the booking of this area so they did they did a healthy uh, merchandise business after that the landscaping company in my defense of not knowing it there is a period where i just um i just recused myself from all news <laughs> so like little like smaller things i'm going to just go huh what i don't well, i don't know <laughs> so that would that would fit in the uh in the in the story then if it was a a minor incident yeah that is that will not be remembered in 10 years and winston sure. Groom is rubbing his hands together that was about <laughs> the uh that was like the the good news that came out of that period of time that was that was something right. that, that everyone could have a good laugh about but uh yeah so mike mulligan is there grinning like a cheshire cat uh and he says, <laughs> it, came, it came up again. My note was that it was a, this is a Terry, C, Terry Silver uh, commitment to evil for evil's sake. He says, uh, um, not half as much as those turkeys that were flying on the ones I shot down. My, uh, Ivan has been buying airlines. Um, he says, we send out orders on the radio for the pilots to land immediately wherever they think the nearest field is and let the bastards off then and there. There's going to be assholes thinking they're headed for Paris, going to be put off cold in Tool, Greenland, or those who were booked in for L.A., they're going to wind up in Montana or Wisconsin or someplace. Ain't they going to be mad, I asked? Screw him, Ivan says, waving his hands. <laughs> That's what it's all about, Gump. Base capitalism. <laughs> so, all right, yep. Well, they used to let us dump, dump toxic waste anywhere. Now there's all these regulations. Uh, he continues... Uh, that's what it's all about, uh, base capitalism. The old fuckaroo. <laughs> we got to consolidate, fire people, get folks scared, and then when they ain't looking, get our hands in their pockets. That's what the deal is, my boy. There's your... And uh, then his comically large cigar, I assume, <laughs> yes. spinning in his mouth. <laughs> yes. That's your uh, high school football coach there. The old fuckaroo. <laughs> <laughs> uh, a Wall Street billionaire, everybody. Ah, oh, it's just, again, funny because they were kind of known for being, you know, it's the banality of evil, just a bunch of dopes. You know? Right, yeah. So no. they, they really didn't have the, <laughs> they weren't Robert De Niro sitting in the front of the theater. Right, I think it's sort of a, a cliche at this point to say that a bunch of people, a bunch of like, you know, future Wall Street bros saw Gordon Gecko and thought that was like the lifestyle, you know, that was how they were, you know, so that, that became it. By virtue of them imitating the fictionalized version of everything, you know, they yes. they took away him as being the hero as opposed to the horrible cautionary tale. Yes, it's like uh, Scarface became, uh, you know, the Al Pacino version became a model 
just right. like Godfather did for those, you know, the losers in the mob in New Jersey, like look at the movie and go, yeah, that could be you. Like, no, you're a way bigger loser. Right. Yes. Yeah, operating out of the back of a deli, sir. Yes. But uh, speaking of not being a loser, Forrest uh, gets some, takes a, he pretty much becomes that, that character right here because um, they, they go to a charity dance, but then Miss Hudgens takes him back to the Leona Helmsy apartment. And this is something that I just, on I, I've been keeping people sort of opposed of, of the events of this book. And I posted, uh, Forrest Gump snorts a line of blow, then bangs his secretary. Because <laughs> yes. that, is, that is what happens here. She says, I want you to sniff this, Forrest. With one hand, she dumps a little white powder from a vial out onto her thumbnail. Why? Because it'll make you feel good. It'll make you feel powerful. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I noted that this is becoming a very different book. And I wonder, did, did Forrest do stuff like this in book number one? Right. Or the, yeah. or the, or the movie? Was he? Uh... I mean, there was one scene where he had very sort of like uncomfortable sex with Jenny. She sort of like, you know, she like, you know, I think she said like, I, I don't remember. I don't want to put words into it, but she's like, he was sort of like had that Forrest Gump expression on his face as she's like throwing herself on top of him. Cause she was like upset or something, but. Mm-hmm. I don't think, I mean, I don't, I, I, I think that there was a, you know, he, he ruined a, a party where the Black Panthers were smoking weed with Jenny. So I, I think he was pretty straight laced. Um, but well, <clears throat> well, this, uh, the Miss Hudgens, uh, she does something so eighties, you know, I, I guess you're picturing here, you know, we're talking about Ivan Bosky and Michael Milken and we're deep in the eighties. And then in an apartment at Le- Leona Helmsley's place. So she does even more eighties things. Soon as we get inside, Miss Hudgens turns on the hi fi. <laughs> what? Burt Bacharach uh, LP stacked up on the uh, turntable. Yeah, really? Uh, the hi fi? <laughs> I mean, we are a couple, we're a couple decades off on that one, aren't we? I, I, I think so, sure. That's a, you know, that's a 60s or at very least like the Steely Dan phase of the 70s. Yeah, but hi-fi implies one of those like big paneled cabinets. Yes, with the sliding top and the records on one side and the turntable on the other. Right. This would have been a prime opportunity to uh, you know show off a, a newfangled compact disc technology. Yes. <laughs> anyway, but, that one stuck out to me. She also um, she also uses a you know your your dad two old fashions in um, as they're starting to get busy. She says, "I've waited a long time for this forest." She says, "I want you." Ah, well, I says, I thought we had sort of a working relationship, you know? Yeah, well, it's time to get you working, she pants. <laughs> I guess I probably didn't do that right. We haven't really done a sonic challenge, but she's panting throughout. Yeah, well, it's time to get you working. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Miss Hudgens. Um, where, who, how did he hire her? What did he say? <laughs> I think that she was just there. So, I mean, I think that they were, she was, you know, working in another department as a sexy secretary. And then they said, we're bringing a new guy in to do this. And we're transferring you there. And um, it doesn't sound like she's being forced to do this. It sounds like she said, I- I've wanted to do this for a long time. So she just fell head over heels for him. I mean, maybe she's a huge football fan. Who yeah, exactly. That could have been it. <laughs> and then um, this, again, different book. After it was over, she smoked a cigarette and thawed her clothes and left. Throwed on her clothes. Mm-hmm. Throwed on her. You can understand why that's hard to read. Sure. And I was left here alone. She had lit the fire in the fireplace and the logs was flickering low and orange and I was not feeling good like I reckon I was supposed to, but sort of lonely and scared and wondering where my life is headed up in New York City. And as I'm lying there staring at the fire, lo and behold, then suddenly appeared Jenny's face in the flames. So he's just done, like freshly done, banging his secretary, <laughs> doing blow, yep. smoking uh, post-coital cigarettes. Mm-hmm. Suddenly, like, hey, hey, dipshit! <laughs> yeah, she does. She calls, she calls him a bozo and says, "You're proud of yourself." I don't know. This sounds like uh, this sounds like this could be the coke working. I don't know. It could be, but yeah, bozo. So she, you know, come on, please. That term is only reserved. Right. For uh, Wall Street uh, fat cats. Right, yes. She also calls him a big moose. <laughs> that stings. But, she, yeah, dude, she just, what's her name, throws the uh, throws her clothes on and left. We get no, like, Mr. Details or anything like that, uh, you know, of uh, of the Mr. and 
what was her name? The, the, the house cleaner. But I was, I was sort of hoping that if there was just a, a incredibly filthy stretch of this, you know, in, uh, it would have right, been, a, right. been quite a shock. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but Forrest laments to Jenny, who's just showed up in his fireplace after he's banged his secretary, uh, snorted Coke. He says, ah, oh, these people, they ain't got no values, Jenny. <laughs> it's all about money and shit and getting your ass in the newspaper columns. He really has been a, a paragon of values to this point, but... Um, you know, more asses as we see. Well, I mean, he's a great dad. You can't yes. deny the father of the year. Yes. <laughs> yeah, he, uh, Forrest has, has, has been mentioned once or twice and he is going to come to New York. But every time that something happens, he says like, so after a couple months in jail or after I was doing this hog farming for a year, I set for my son. So who knows how even old he is by this point in time. I picture he probably grew up into that, uh, the, the little kid from uh, Terminator 2. Oh, sure. You know, like yeah. p- picking locks and riding motorcycles and smoking <laughs> cigarettes and, yeah. you know, growing, growing his hair long on one side. Yeah. <laughs> Shut up, like Dad. That. Yeah. <laughs> Wearing a public enemy T-shirt. Yes. Oh, man. One of the coolest guys. I mean, if you, were, if you were the same age as him, you were just like, my God, that kid must be the happiest kid alive. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but so Forrest, what did he call Mr. Squeegee? He said a Hitler stash. There was another guy that he said looked like the Nazi for Raiders of the Lost Ark. So for yeah. a guy who pretty much compares every third character he sees to Nazis, he trusts at, trusts at a, a pretty flimsy excuse when people, Jenny's like criticizing his choices. He says, uh, I am doing what I am told, I says. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so, uh, you know, maybe uh, maybe cast that, that, that Nazi, Nazi dar inwards. He's, uh, yeah, the office space thing. You know, well, you know, the, the Nazis had flair. <laughs> She's like, you can't pull up that. You can't compare them to Nazis. Yes. Uh, but then Forrest, uh, little Forrest does come to town. Um, he, uh, he's wearing dungarees and a T-shirt and uh, looks around and delivers his opinion. I'd rather be back at the pig farm. How come? <laughs> What's so good about all this, he says. You got a nice view. So what? Right, settle, settle the hell down, little forest. <laughs> like, <laughs> you come to the hog farm, you criticize the hog farm, you come here, you say you wish you were back at the hog farm. Yeah, this uh, this kid, I don't know. What, what is the purpose of the of the kid? Do you know? I I mean, I know, based on, you, you look at the cover and it's them on the park bench and little forest is like reading something and forest is taking a nap on him. You, th- you sort of thought it was going to be a... Uh, you know, three men and a baby type of thing, like Madcap Adventures Together. But he he just sort of pops in and out of the scenes whenever he's needed to to criticize something or or act sad. You know, whichever whichever one the situation calls for. Right. Um, <clears throat> did you uh, did you pick up on this when they? So he's taken him around to the Metropolitan Museum of Art, King Tut's tomb, and the F A O Schwartz store. Yeah. Who they might have run into there? Oh wow, sure, wow. Mr. Tom Hanks and uh, Robert Loggia jumping <laughs> exactly. up and down on a giant keyboard. <laughs> I suppose that's uh, that's a hundred percent the reference. Even though he goes on to meet Tom Hanks paragraphs later, that's what drove me insane. Like, why not just do it there? <laughs> you're yeah. there. You're in the store. That is so stupid and frustrating. <laughs> But I did appreciate that when they went to the uh, met to the Metropolitan Museum of Art, uh, Little Forest, like any given dumbass who goes to that art museum, wants to see either the Egyptian wing or the arms and armory thing. You know, you're like, I can't look at a painting. I, I got to go look at the suits of armor, like because I I have absolutely done that before. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, but he takes them to uh, Elaine's. Yep. Then, I don't right? know. If, I don't know if there's a real life analog. I do not care. There is. Okay. There is. I've been there. I think I, I want to advertise a uh, Patreon extra because I won't tell the story. Okay. I have a, a, I have a Boffo Elaine's story. Wow. Okay. A, a sighting and a near fist fight in Elaine's with a very famous person. And this has, it has a denouement that you will, is jaw dropping. Tremendous. That's, I mean, that happens like, a couple years later, like a, <laughs> a curtain like a, call to it. That a Forrest is, Gumpian incident? Uh, absolutely Forrest Gumpian. And, wow. But I, I'm not going to burn it here. I'm gonna, set, it's going to be an extra. That sounds perfect. That is selling the sizzle. And that uh, 
That, that hopefully that bumps us up to the level where you have to go to Gump and uh, Bubble oh, Gump shit. Shrimp Company because Damn it. hoist hey, on my own petard. I drank a I drank a soda that had Hormel chili fat in it a weekend ago and posted a video about that experience. So <laughs> yeah, do you want to say a few words about that? What was the flavor like? Uh, it was not good. It was. I mean, it didn't taste like shit, as Forrest would say, but essentially the root beer really sweetened it up. The Hormel chili fat was very overpowering, I would say, Mm. as you would expect it to be from jumping in the orange fat. And then uh, Zatrin's crab boil is an actual product. And what what that is is a bunch of spices, essentially, that comes in a little, like, sachet that you don't even, you just put it right into the pot. And you do that because all these loose things are like mustard seeds, peppercorns. Yeah, and coriander. I drank the, yes, and I drank the soda with the straw, and those things came right up through it like a boba tea, which is a jarring experience uh, when you're drinking something that tastes bad to begin with. Also, oh. there is something called uh, cream of tartar that goes into it that reacts yeah. with baking soda. So that causes some unneeded bubbling. Um, there was a, a time, you know, it was all psychosomatic, but about an hour later, I was like, do I not feel good? <laughs> Um, but yeah, you can see the full video process over on the Patreon. Did the fat, I assume it congealed. Did you have ice in the drink? It did. Um, I, I, I stirred the whole thing up. Um, and I, I did use a straw, so it did impart a lot of flavor. I don't know if I ever got a, a, a goopy thing of that coming through like an actual boba. Did you ever, it reminds me of like getting that, you know, a piece of fat through the, through the straw or whatever. The, uh, when you had pork and beans, Mm -hmm. my my dad used to make us pork and bean my dad kind of grew up very poor and so he always wanted to introduce us to great (laughs) like you're gonna love this i love this things that he had to eat or things that he thought were luxuries that you would then appreciate no things that that he had to eat and therefore he just kept it like he buy blood sausage for hard tack night (laughs) yeah you gotta have this Uh, but the uh you you always thought it was great when you found the pork in the pork and beans when you were at first and you're like, Ooh, I found it. Here it is. Mm-hmm. It is a chunk of congealed, like just the grossest fat. I was going to uh, say so you'd, you'd eat it and go, I got the bake. Woo. And then like, Oh dear, I've made a huge mistake. Yeah. It was like the opposite of a lucky charm marshmallow for me. I would be just like, Nope. <laughs> yes. Oh, so you, you learn quickly, but all right. Anyway, well, that's, that's we'll over on Patreon. Story. Yeah. Patreon.com slash three seventy two pages. Uh, I mean, you know, if if the Bubba Gump thing happens, maybe we can make it uh, while I'm out there for the summer or something. Because I'm 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 intrigued myself. Um. Yeah. Please, we'll you, please come with me. We'll see. That, <laughs> that would be fun. <laughs> um. And so at Elaine's, uh, they they get a table, and she essentially teases that that famous people are going to show up. Yeah. Um, but she says Barbara Streisand. Woody Allen, Kurt Vonnegut, George Plimpton, Lauren Bacall, maybe Paul Newman or Jack Nicholson. Um, and so they, they tease all that and say that, uh, listen, there's one rule. Just don't don't harass them. You can sit at the round table. Mother, maybe other people will come in um, next to you. And uh, so it quickly became obvious once Elizabeth Taylor waltzed in and along with Bruce Willis, Donald Trump, share the movie star that this is where this is where the Hanks thing was going to happen. Yes. Uh, but this got me thinking about that song. Uh, this is also a, a throwback, but it, it stuck with me because I, I used to call my friends and leave uh, song parody messages on their <laughs> phones because of it's uh, Rockabye by uh, Sean oh, Mullins. Yeah, yeah. Yep. A talk she, song, right? With a very yeah, memorable chorus. She grew up in the Hollywood Hills. <laughs> and then he says, she used to go to parties with... So, you know, Sonny and Cher or something. <laughs> and it struck me that this would be a good one. I went down to a party. There was George Plimpton and William Styron and Mr. Spinelli. <laughs> but I used to I used to think of the lamest stars that were on, like, uh, the, the $10,000 pyramid or something. Yeah, yeah, and call yeah. my friends up and, Fanny I just got to tell you, I just went to a party <laughs> with Paul Lind and Fanny Flagg. <laughs> They'd be like, don't stop that. Stop, please. <laughs> yeah, really. That's probably why people all over the world stop listening to their voicemail. <laughs> well, yeah, it's a pretty lame because I don't know who Mr. Spinelli or William Styron are. And it's surprising that Forrest Gump would as well. It doesn't seem like he's a very well-read individual. He has that uh, flexible knowledge, which sure. uh, I have a couple comments coming up where I'm like, wait a minute. <laughs> Mr. Mr. Bidness. 
<laughs> Mr. Ass suddenly becomes very erudite. Well, yeah. No, no, no. Here you go. It's uh, she, she says the Lane says the movie stars talk about themselves. I imagine. What about the writers? Writers? Huh? They are talking about what they always talk about: baseball, money, and pieces of ass. <laughs> so, so it's like you might have. It's hard to do, but like the way that Ernest Klein sort of uh, twisted and and desecrated the work of Kurt Vonnegut in his books, like this might be even more of an inaccurate uh, portrayal of what he was like as a as a person, probably. Right. Like, let's talk right. about the human condition and how it was affected by war, with some pathos and dark humor thrown in. Hey, he's talking about baseball and pieces of ass. <laughs> Uh, did you ever, uh, speaking of stories, Kevin Murphy's famous story of, of us meeting Kurt Vonnegut. Yeah. Was that at, uh, was that at Elaine's? That was at a Four Seasons. Whoa, speaking right. of. Uh, the, the yard yeah. wall continues. And what was yeah. his story? We might have talked about it on here before, but let's tell, tell me again. The very quick tale is that uh, we saw Kurt Vonnegut standing alone several times and all of us were, uh, all of us are kind of, you know, fans of Kurt Vonnegut. Like, well. He's he's a living legend. We got it, and he's hanging out by himself. Uh-huh. So let's uh, let's see if he just wants to come to dinner. We'll see. Yeah. <laughs> it's gonna be it's gonna be easy. So Kevin hops out of our car. We're gonna go somewhere, and he goes up to Vonnegut, who's smoking outside the Four Seasons, <laughs> and says, uh, "Hey, we're you know this TV show, and we all are big fans. We'd love to, you know, just buy you dinner. Mm-hmm. You know, be an easy hour." And he said, uh, "Yeah, I'm 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 busy. I would love to, but I'm busy." Fair enough. Uh, we leave. We come back to the hotel later that night. Kurt Vonnegut sitting in the restaurant by himself eating. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man. <laughs> oh man, I, I would do it too. I don't. I don't uh, know. It's, it was I think... very. It was very funny though, where we all just like it was the same. It was so perfect. A one single top table. Him just <laughs> reading a magazine. And They're eating mopping around him like. <laughs> Uh, I think that's probably been in the back of my mind every time there's ever been someone like famous at Sketchfest or uh, uh, that we've encountered that I've been like, oh, it'd be really cool to. Ha- uh, I, I don't want to set yeah. myself up for. <laughs> for them I've to only run and do had disappointment. Yes, I've only had failure and disappointment any time. I'm just like, hey, I know you. Hey, I'm a big fan. Like it, it ends up with me walking away like. Uh, with my head down and the Snoop, the sad peanut yeah. song playing. <laughs> <laughs> All right. The Tom Hanks things happen. We've already done that. It's yeah. incredibly stupid. I don't know what else to say about it. I just thought it was just, we, we, we read that it was happening because of fanfic last week. And then I just, the way that it happens was just so artlessly done. Um, you know, it takes all of uh, probably 150 words for it to happen. And, but Tom Hanks says, Life is like a box of chocolates. By the way, I just happen to have a box of chocolates right here. You want to buy some? So I don't know what was going on there. And then he, Tom Hanks looks at him kind of funny because he doesn't want to buy the chocolates and says, well, stupid is as stupid looks, I always say, which is not the line in the movie. Um, so, right. uh, and then he gets up and goes to another table. And that's the end of that encounter, of that pointless encounter. He, he tries to sell him the chocolate for whatever reason. And then, I mean, I don't know if that's commentary um, with like all caps, bold commentary on Hollywood. And then he misquotes stupid is as stupid does and leaves. So, I, yeah, I, I'm not giving him any credit. I think he completely. Blew it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> there is probably maybe a clever joke or something somewhere available to him, which he did not take and instead chose the route of. Tom Hanks trying to sell him chocolates. Ha, 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 ha. Ha, 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 ha. I don't know. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's probably before the uh, internet was widespread. So Winston Groom, he strikes me as he could be like a typewriter kind of guy. He might not have even bothered to uh, look up the quote he misremembered from his own movie. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, and, th- and this already long chapter then ends with uh, another, what is the disturbance oh no no oh sorry they go to the office and mm-hmm. mr bozo is arrested yeah he's for insider of, trading yeah, yeah he's p- packing up the fbi's raiding the joint and it gets them all thrown in jail where they uh <laughs> they got we got a we got a reference here that that i did appreciate because it is a it is a funny old-timey thing and it made me wish we had like a historical forrest gump almost Going back through these things, because... Uh, oh, I know what you're going to say, yes. Because <laughs> <laughs> someone says, uh, oh, yeah, Little Forrest comes to see him in jail and says, 
He said, Forrest says, how'd you find out? And little Forrest says, how could I not find out? It's been all over the papers and television. Folks are saying it's the biggest scandal since Teapot Dome. <laughs> so Forrest go- little Forrest goes a little Dennis Miller here to, uh, to, br- to break that one out. <laughs> yeah, it's like uh, Nitzer Ebb playing a set over at the Teapot Dome. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Who? <laughs> Sorry, that was a Jazz? A, a German '80s uh, electronica band. Of course, of course. <laughs> there was a, when we were doing our, our riff tracks. The game we had a spreadsheet that had hundreds and hundreds of clips to log, and we wrote a dozen jokes for each one of them. But the very first line was some old timey coronet short, and I had to, for whatever reason, I was in this first. So every time you opened up this document, the very first thing you'd see was a. A woman apologizing, saying that her husband couldn't come play because he was grounded for his role in the Teapot Dome scandal. Uh, so that really set the tone for that whole project. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> oh, um, so this is already long chapter. I think we should like it's quickly. Quite long. Yep, yep. God, it just goes on and on and on. Uh, but we do get so we get Teapot Dome is good. Oh, also on the the naming thing, they go to the federal courtroom and the prosecutor is. Mr. Gugulianti. Gugulianti, yeah. It sounds like I am the walrus. Yes, and I can only imagine, speaking of, Giuliani's already come up, so it was yeah, pressing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it was bizarre. I said, speaking of Four Seasons. Again, how stung must he have been by that? <laughs> Gugug, yeah. Well, I mean, it says he looks like he ought to be mayor someday, uh, but, I mean, you're reading that, it sounds like you're doing the so... I mean, yeah, ruined him. (laughs) He was very hurt by this. Can you imagine crying himself to sleep every night? (laughs) Winston Groom called me goo goo auntie. (laughs) But like, we we even get this later. I think there was a a New York Post headline, but the New York Post must have had, you know, a dozen different uh, names for Giuliani over the years. And I can't imagine they ever arrived at goo goo (laughs) (laughs) Um, And then we get... We we talked about this offline. Whew. I I don't even know what to say about that. Why don't you take give me your take on this? Okay. I, I assume you know what I'm talking about. The, yeah, the law the it, law firm. It's so they're just doing a a little recap of the trial, but in the middle of it all, he he inserts this line that so Mr. Brozowski, our lawyer, asks, "Are you guilty of insider trading? We are being represented, incidentally, by the big old New York law firm of." Dewey, screw him, and how. <laughs> mm. Speaking of your 1930s joke books. I mean, that has to go back to the beginning of time. I can't imagine. So uh, It's yeah. Dewey, Cheatham, and how, but, you know, regional differences. Yes, yes. But it, it does. That, that line, Dewey, screw him, and how, or Dewey, cheat him, and how, has its own Wikipedia page. It's that well-trod of, a, of an incident. <laughs> and, like, when I looked at it, and it was like, you know, saved by the bell, used it. Like, that's the level. You know, Johnny Carson, I guess, would make it. But back to the Three Stooges, like, uh, speaking of Leona Helmsley, she, they had a, a, whatever you call their episodes or something, where they were um, the, the three attorneys working at Dewey, Cheatham, and Howe. So that's how well trod that is. Vaudeville era. Right. Uh, in fact, as we were talking about it, I'll just bring it up very quickly. There is... Uh, I don't know how they populate these with bots or whatever, where they do like the top 10 something or other, and then you click on it and you go, oh, this is just, why did I click on this? Most of us know now not to click on them, where they're fake reviews of things. Yes. So I was looking up Dewey, Cheatham, and How, and um, there's a a site called, uh, I don't know how they buy these. It's called Plum Bar Oakland, (laughs) and there's a monkey wrench. A, uh, a plunger, toilet plunger, and a pipe. So Plum Bar Oakland has the 10 best Dewey, Cheatham, and Howe t-shirts of 2022. <laughs> of 2022. I think it's the only title. half over. I mean, this is a sticky site, as they used to say. In the, I mean, once you're on this site, you can't get off. You can't stop reading. And and then, it, it true to its form, it does have 1 through 10 of the top, uh, of 2022, the top best Dewey, Cheatham, and Howe t-shirts. Sure. But I just thought I would read the, uh, obviously, uh, bot-populated uh, okay, text. please. Do you need help deciding which is best Dewey, Cheatham, and Howe t-shirt to use? <laughs> Based on expert reviews, we rank them. 
Here are the top-ranked Dewey, Cheatham, and Howe t-shirt, including those that sell well. Can't find the perfect Dewey, Cheatham, and Howe t-shirt to buy? (laughs) Since we have already gone through the Dewey, Cheatham, and Howe t-shirt research project, we understand the problem. Oh, and, yes. then it goes, and then it goes on to solve your problem. Wow. So it's doing a, has this ever happened to you thing as a housewife is searching for a Dewey Cheetah and House shirts and then she throws up her hands and goes to, what was it? San Fran Plum? Uh, Plum Bar, Oakland. Okay. <laughs> uh, the, by the way, the number nine shirt is a Ferris Bueller's Day Off Abe Froman t-shirt. <laughs> so... <laughs> <laughs> which which you could actually buy, the Sausage King of Chicago, Abe Froman. So, but who was well, not related to Dewey, Cheatham, and Howe, and they did not I, use that joke. No way that I would ever know. I don't I think it's just, yeah. But wow. that's, the, that's the number nine of 2022. I mean, maybe 2023 will be a better year. But uh, well, it, well, it says a lot that there isn't one that says uh, Dewey, Cheatham, and Howe, like we represented Forrest Gump and Ivan Bozowski. That, that speaks to this site's lack of stickiness. I mean, this book's yeah. lack of stickiness. So they order a that he has a psychiatric examination, which is a good way to burn uh, burn a couple paragraphs here. They they bong him on the knees to test his reflexes, and then they certify him as an idiot. But he overrules that, so it has no consequence whatsoever. <laughs> and then he goes back to uh, his his table in the courtroom where Ivan and Mike are both again grinning like Cheshire cats. So it manifests itself twice in this uh, in this very long chapter. Mm-hmm. It's a super long chapter. It was very long. It was very long. Um, and, but- and again, the courtroom stuff where we talked about it before, you, courtroom is where you get the clever barbs in and the digs and stuff like that, right? Yeah. And, 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 you know, these lawyers are just not, cl- not clever at all. <laughs> yeah. You, uh, in theory, you have a, a lawyer who sets yourself up for that, but that's when instead we got teapot dome uh, jokes, but... It, it does have one. Uh, it has a bunch of objection and overrules and all that sort of thing. So potentially, uh, potentially filmable, but it pretty much just ends with, uh, of course, pandemonium breaking out and objections and uh, reporters calling in the story and all of them going to prison because Forrest decided that he wasn't going to take one for the team this time, like he did with Ollie North. He was going to say that he uh, he did no wrong. They told him what to do. All this stuff. So they're furious with him, and they're all going to prison. <laughs> And then it ends with, you know, one of those things that uh, it's like a line you could hear from maybe The Wire or from Clint Eastwood. He says, like I said, sometimes a man's just got to do the right thing, <laughs> which eh, you've never really said that before. <laughs> you, yes. you, you have pretty much the entire book is you floating along like the moron uh, with no roots and no code whatsoever. So yeah. But sure, why not? In chapter eight, right. suddenly you have a code. Okay. Sure. Well, sometimes, you know, not when your secretary is offering you cocaine in your luxury hi- hi-fi apartment, but uh, true. sometimes. Don't, <laughs> don't do the right thing. I mean, admittedly, he was enticed by a hi-fi at that point. So. <laughs> yes, right. <laughs> uh, well, before we, uh, since that chapter was so long, that was like half of our, our reading this time. We can do uh, real or... This, I, might, I haven't looked. This might be our final real or fanfic of this book. I, it depends how long this final uh, section of Forrest Gump is, but... We'll, uh, we'll see if these are going to prove to be as tricky or lack thereof as the first uh, segments. We have five passages, potentially uh, all real, potentially all fanfic, or a combination of the two. And the fanfic is, of course, written by our beloved Patreon supporters, who we've already discussed at patreon.com slash 372 pages, where you get all the fun stuff we've talked about now and are going to do... Uh, um, more fun stuff that we've discussed there, like your uh, your mystery story about Elaine's. I promise that this is a good story. <laughs> uh, but let's get right into it. So again, we have five of these. Here's number one. Well, old Bill sound looked like sort of a nice guy. I mean, he seemed pretty genuine and had husky, down to earth voice, white woolly hair, a big old reddish nose, looked like Santa Claus's, and a nice laugh. And he even introduced us to his wife, Hillary who come out of a trailer wearing a granny dress and a hairdo, looked like a beetle wig, and brung us some Kool-Aid. Listen, Bill says in almost a whisper, I ain't supposed to say anything to anybody about this, but the truth is, the Whitewash River property is right over by the Smack Over All Foundation. Even, even if you don't build a house here, if you buy it now before anyone else finds out, you'll be a millionaire a hundred times over, account of the all. Just about then, an old feller shows up on the scene, and when I seen him, I like to have fainted dead away. Fellers, Bill says, I want you to meet my partner. It was Mr. Tribble, my old chess championship mentor. (laughs) 
I think he comes up here. Um, I'm going to do, let me see. I'm going to do the, my test this time is going to be the Larry King. Does it make Larry King laugh? Got so it. I'm going to have to put myself in the mind. Ah, <laughs> snowy white hair, big red nose. That does sound like the Bill Clinton I know. <laughs> However, I oh. believe that's fanfic. Wow. All right. <laughs> Thank you, Larry. Number two, the Miami Herald. A former New Orleans Saints football player who has been described as a grade A halfwit may have inadvertently caused the invasion of Kuwait by its neighbor Iraq. <laughs> Mr. Forrest Gump, a previous resident of Alabama, has been on assignment with the U.S. State Department in the Middle East, according to sources close to the matter. During a verbal dispute with an Iraqi Republican Guard commander, Mr. Gump claimed that he could outrun them pieces of shit tanks you Iraqis got. Not taking, not taking too kindly to fight in words like that, the commander sested, suggested a race to Kuwait City with Mr. Gump on foot against the Iraqi commander in his T-72 tank. Sixteen hours later, a physically exhausted Mr. Gump arrived in Kuwait City, followed by an entire division of Iraqi tanks in pursuit. Upon seeing the invading Iraqi forces, all hell broke loose among the locals. They was running for their lives, knocking over strangers, what have you, said one eyewitness to the ensuing fracas. Hmm. Well, as you know, I was on the air a lot during that uh, <laughs> skirmish. Uh, and though that strikes me as somewhat real, I am going to call it that is fanfic. All right, Larry, thank you very much. Who do you have next on the show? Coming up next, uh, we have two of the Golden Girls. <laughs> uh, number three. Little Forrest one night asked the question, what about old Wanda? Well, I says, I reckon they probably treating her pretty good up at the zoo in Washington but he ain't satisfied. Well, I says, let us write them a letter and see if they will send her back. So that's what we did. Few months later, there come the reply. The National Zoo does not return animals that rightfully belong to it, was pretty much the gist of it. Well, Little Forest says, that don't seem fair. I mean, after all, we raised her from a piglet, didn't we? Yup, I reckon, I says. We just lent her to the zoo while I was with the Ayatolja. Anyway, we went to see Colonel North, who was operating out of a guardhouse he had built on our grounds, and told him the situation. Them bastards, he began, employing his usual tact and diplomacy. Then we will just have to organize a clandestine operation to get Wanda back. Hmm. That's more muted. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry. That, uh, that's, uh, I haven't read the whole book, but I believe he's correct that his hog went to the, uh, uh, went to the zoo, the National Zoo. So that checks out. Uh, coming up next for the whole 90 minutes, we have Dana Carvey. I'm going to say that that is real. Wow. All right. Number four. Tell him I love that Turtle Man character. Turtle, turtle. <laughs> yes, he loves it. Uh, number four. As the weeks and months went by, we added to our operation by getting more and more barges, and we had to hire more people to help us in the oyster and bidness. Little Four has also done come up with another idea, and in fact, it is what made us rich. Listen, he says one day after we brought in a big load of oysters, I've been thinking, where is the best place to grow an oyster? In shit, I answered. <laughs> exactly, he says. And where is the most shit in the whole bay? Probably by the sewage treatment plant, I says. Exactly. So here's what we do. We go out there and plant oysters. Thousands of them. Millions. Hmm. Oh. Also very muted. Could be, <laughs> could be real. Ah, oh, boy. Uh, for the next 30 minutes, by the way, with Dixie Carter and then Annie Potts will be coming on <laughs> designing women. Uh, I'm going to say that, uh, wow, that's real. Okay. And our final one, Larry, we have number five, the New York Times. Information has come to light that last week's diplomatic disaster was called by one Forrest Gump of Alabama, a recently court-martialed U.S. Army private. Described by his co-workers as a goddamn nimrod, Gump put <laughs> Ipecac on the plate given to President George Bush during his meeting with Prime Minister Kichi Mizayawa of Japan. This caused the president to hurl on the prime minister, an act which analysts will say will push U.S.-Japan relationships back 40, 50 years. That incompetent buffoon thought it was an exotic spice, screamed the head of the catering company as he was being escorted from his office by armed guards. <laughs> I mean, that's funny. That happened. <laughs> he did throw up on the prime minister. <laughs> uh, we have Ro Senator Robert Byrd is going to be here for the next hour. I'm going to say... That that is fanfic. Okay. 
Well, let's take a look at how uh, Larry King did. I said he did not read this book, but uh, was doing his own guessing. Let's go back to number one. Uh, number one was Bill, big old nose. Uh, his wife, Hillary, uh, sounded like Whitewater, the, uh, that scandal. I don't mm-hmm. know what the... That, you said fan for that. That is real. We got that to look forward to. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what the smack over all formation is. I assume. I do not know what that is either. <laughs> white water. That was something that I just, you know, as a, as a 11 year old was like, if opera man's not talking about it on SNL, I, that's, <laughs> I have no, no knowledge of what right. this is, but um, anyway, so that's real. Number two, number two was the uh, article about him uh, leading the tanks to Kuwait uh fanfic is what you said that was fanfic written by brad all right 50 percent um number three was uh re- organizing a clandestine operation to get wanda back with uh oliver north you said real that is real all right submitted okay. by katie um so that's another thing to look forward to i'm not sure how that caper is gonna going to wind down but uh, I'm, I'm glad that he's returning to oliver north what a rich character in this book <laughs> thank yeah. you for that i'm trying to think of what uh, what what antics they might uh, get up to in dc they could they could like uh their clandestine operation could end up being uh, uh they, they bug a hotel room that's the one where mary and barry is caught smoking crack on on camera the mayor who then got <laughs> sure. re-elected mayor uh maybe that's that right. could be what happens um number four uh, so you're two for three Number four uh, was uh, oyster farming and uh, putting them by the sewage treatment plant. You said real for that. That is also real. Wow. Come on. These are bold choices for me. They bold. were. They were. Because they yeah. were. these ones, we got, some, we got some good fanfic. We also got some fairly unsubtle fanfic. So okay. I tr- tried to keep it, uh, you know, uh, tried to keep it uh, a, a little more possible, but you, you're sniffing them out. Um, that was submitted by Craig. And then number five. Uh, this was the New York Times article about barfing on the prime minister of Japan, something I had not thought about in probably 20 years. So it made me laugh when I read this when it was submitted. But you said fanfic for that. And that was fanfic submitted by Harris. Yes. So that's four, four out five? of five. Yeah. Not bad. Man, Larry. This might be, this might be I'm going to have to hire him. Yet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. All right. Well, let's, uh, let's keep on moving uh, to chapter nine. Okay. Let's do it. No. Uh, where did we end? Oh, we ended with uh, him going to jail because he didn't take the... So once again, we're in prison, right? <laughs> uh, yeah, the, uh, the, we, we get this note. The trial had already ended, but it says, not long after my testimony, they carted Ivan and Mike off to prison. The judge, he throwed the book at them. Literally, big old law book. Hit Bozoski square in the head. So it's 1930s joke book meets Bazooka Joe meets Tom and Jerry at this point in time. (laughs) Why did he throw his clock out the window to see time fly? (laughs) Uh, But the newspaper gag, how is it working with you? This is, again, we've brought up before, this is like songs in Tolkien. I'm kind of so tempted to just skip. I think that's, yeah, that's reasonable. Um, It's it's not working for me, especially for this one, because as we said before, this is the New York Post. The, you know, the uh, headless body and topless bar type of headline, you know. Um, yes. Uh, just, 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 just puns, savage puns about, you know, the sports instance or whatever. And the headline it, re- it re- rolls out for this is Dullard Rats Out on High Rolling Financial Man. Um, like, so come on now. That's, that's, that's garbage. They, they would have had, uh, you know, 12 better headlines submitted for this, none of which I took the time to bother to come up with. No, they would certainly Dump, have... Dumps chumps. I mean, there you go. Yes, <laughs> yes. There's a famous... Um, it was uh, Variety Magazine used to do it. You know, they'd come up with their own terms for for all sorts of things. Just mm-hmm. insider crap. And one of their headlines was uh, Hicks, Nicks, Sticks, Picks. Oh, sure. <laughs> famously. Because and then you had to go, wait, what? Hicks? Oh, okay, so people from the... <laughs> don't try to, to uh, make movies made for people in the sticks was yes. the thing. But that okay. was their Hicks, Nicks, Sticks, Picks was their headline. Yeah, that was in a... I had a book that was like the bracketology of everything. So it would sort of uh, do a final four bracket of newspaper headlines. And that was one of the entrants. Oh, okay, that, uh... yep, yep, <laughs> pretty famous. Uh, so he gets uh, recruited for... They tell him you you got to get out of here. The uh, the army, the army tells him. So uh, Colonel North, that great character, Colonel North, mm-hmm. 
gets them out of there and sends them to Alaska. Uh, yeah, he, I guess the army threw him in jail cause he was a wall while he was, you know, in prison or whatever he, whatever he had done. Um, but yes. so yeah, Colonel, Colonel North stops by the stockade where he's been for months <laughs> feeding him bread and water. Mm-hmm. And, and yeah, it says he's uh, going to transfer your big ass up as far away as I possibly can. <laughs> which, <laughs> which turns out to be an army weather station in Alaska. Yeah. I like how he tried to, uh. When he was thinking of what he could do, he scratched his chin for a minute. <laughs> and, you know, it's one of those things. I, I, I wanted to go to the dark web, but I said, you know, our listeners only have so much patience. Sure, sure. <laughs> <laughs> just well, to get just, <laughs> some real ASMR chin scratching noises for a minute. Please insert right here in your own mind one minute of Oliver North scratching his chin and thinking. Because I was this close to doing it. I think everyone is going to appreciate your restraint there. I know I do. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, uh, so he, he is in Alaska. And uh, if you're if you're curious about whether this is going to be a... Uh, if, if Winston Groom maybe uh, took this as an opportunity to uh, expense a trip to Alaska for fact-finding missions... Um, or whether it's going to be a a you know cartoon uh, version of Alaska by someone who's never been there, it, it is of course the latter. He he goes ice fishing. He gets chased by a polar bear, and also gets chased by a big old walrus that ate up all the fish I had caught. <laughs> so a a sensitive and nuanced portrayal of our of America's final frontier here. I feel like he didn't even bother to go to Facts King when he could, <laughs> to learn yes. everything he could about our fiftieth state and. Uh, I actually have the the oof line about this, and maybe Kinky Friedman's on board with it, but um, he was in a little old town there by the ocean where all the people spent most of the time getting drunk. Eskimos included. The Eskimos was was very nice people, except when they got drunk and had harpoon-throwing contests in the street. Then it could be dangerous to be out and about. <laughs> Oof. <laughs> Tug yeah. at the collar there. Yeah. <laughs> Not a, aging well. Yeah, but like also from 1995 where that was a, uh, you know, it's not a Nanook of the North or anything where he's, uh, <laughs> it's Jack London type of thing. It's uh, Eskimos. He, he didn't have to do it. Yeah. Well, it comes back later because he, uh, he goes looking for a um, gift to send Forrest and he's looking for a totem pole so he gets a three-foot totem pole carved with eagles' beaks and faces of stern-looking Indians and bears' paws and all. And, I, you know, I, I, I head on the heels of the spear fights in the street, I was like, is this even, is this even possible? Um, and it turns out that uh, totem poles were a, a uh, um, yeah. by First Nations indigenous people in the Pacific Northwest Coast, including northern Northwest Coast, Haida, Tingit, Timshin communities in Southeast Alaska and British Columbia. So maybe, uh, maybe that was the extent of the research that Groom did there. Uh, but that was an instance of, uh, this is obviously a joke I'm not getting because it, it's like sort of escalates like, hey, how much to buy this? Oh, for you, you know, $10,000 or yeah. whatever. And then like, oh, well, what if it wasn't, what if I didn't get the discount? Then it would be 80000 you know, like, <laughs> <That's right. laughs> well, can you ship it? Sure. That's $400 million. Like, I don't get what the joke is. Uh, this this has to be a joke and then at the end and then he just leaves out the he assumes like come on we all love telling this Eskimo joke at right. our parties right. had a couple of drinks you know what the punchline is i don't need to say it right and the punchline so, is something like you know but i thought you were a duck and then right. <laughs> just doesn't have it in there uh, i just just a quick uh parenthetical so he's describing uh this is again the the thing where forest Sometimes all of a sudden just has phrases or words where you're like, wait, thought you were self-proclaimed idiot, Mm -hmm. his words, but no, he's, and he worked at a strip joint. (laughs) Um, We got to a place called the Gold Rush Saloon and went inside. There was all sorts of activity there. Folks be drinking and fighting and gambling. And a striptease artist was doing her thing. <laughs> ah, an artiste has come in. <laughs> he, well, and a naked lady be taking her crap off. Yeah. Like, that's... what? A striptease artist was 
performing her act for everyone who seemed to be taking it in with with quite anticipation. Well, that's the side of him that recognized uh, Kurt Vonnegut and uh, Norman Mailer in the uh, in the uh, Elaine's restaurant a couple chapters ago. <laughs> yes, well, it's just odd that he has striptease artist as his. Uh, it's right at his fingertips. That's awesome. But also in the uh, in there, and he's probably been enjoying the striptease artist for a while because he's passed out, uh, face down, drunk. Is Mister McGiver from the Pig Shit Farm? Yes. So the uh, so the idiotic coincidences are really stacking up here. Uh, and uh, I thought that I said that Mr. McGiver jumps up and gives him a big hug. And then we get a sentence that the fact that this sentence makes perfect sense, you know, if you had read it yeah. with no context, yeah. you would have been furious and said, well, this book's going to no places. But the fact that it makes sense is all the indictment of the book you need. Mm-hmm. I figure he is going to be real mad at me for letting the pig shit blow up. But in fact, he ain't. <laughs> mm-hmm. So if that, if that was, you know, the, uh, the, the top quote for this book on Goodreads, I would not be too unhappy. <laughs> And it also is, does this ring true to you? So he's up at a bar in Alaska, face down. What is he drinking? Gin, whatever. He has a whole bottle already. Mm, empty quart of gin. Quart. All right. Don't worry yourself, my boy, Mr. McGiver says. It was probably all a blessing in disguise anyway. I never dreamed the pig shit operation would get that big says the man who drank a quart of gin. But once it did, I was under such pressure to keep up with things. It probably was taking years off my life. Maybe you even did me a favor. And then craps himself and yep. falls on the table, which cracks in two and he vomits. And yeah, then... one of his teeth falls out into his uh, thing. And then he takes a shot of the uh, the gin that they preserve the severed thumb in that they always are pouring out for tourists in this town. And then he goes, oh, I swallow the thumb again. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, so if, if Forrest Gump encounters Queen Elizabeth, she'd be like, you know, thank you for hopping by here. Could check in about that business at the Tower of London, Forrest. But now he meets, yes. you know, uh, Mr. McGivery, who's drinking, you know, 18 shots of gin. And he's like, oh, my boy, <laughs> yes. I was under such pressure. Now, please, let us enjoy a fine cigar and enjoy the striptease artist. <laughs> Yes, he becomes a, uh, you know, one of like the Dickens characters, you know, saviors like, oh, my brother and I have been in the book business for years, my boy, <laughs> sit down, of course, of course, uh, so bizarre. Uh, when did this, when did uh, it kick in for you? So uh, there, I'm sure there's some people who are not reading the book who are maybe wondering what's going to happen here. When did you realize where this one was headed? It took me embarrassingly long. Um. I was on the lookout for it. Okay. So the the next two big events that come up because we have one more chapter, mm-hmm. uh, I I guessed. Okay. With entirely and with and and also hated myself for knowing that it was going <laughs> like, like sort of a uh, it's going to be this, isn't it? And then when you read it, it's like there's no satisfaction to this. No, not this, at all. This makes it worse. This this one uh, this one I be, so the next chapter he goes to Germany so I think we both saw where that was coming this one it sure. took me until Mister McCaptain you know he's like why are you here and uh, he says I am a ship's captain he says proudly and that was when I was just like oh my god yep. <laughs> got me a big old ship out in the harbor right now you want to see it and he says the ship is so big from a distance it looks like a mountain range it is about half a mile long and twenty stories high Exxon Valdez is the ship's name. And like, oh, I just, God damn it! <laughs> it why not? Is, a, why not uh, Exxon? Well, well, I don't know. Let's let's workshop the name. But why does he just call it the name? Why does yeah, he call it right. Exxon Bozo D's or something? Like that? <laughs> uh, but he does say, uh, "Climb aboard!" Mister McGiver shouts. And here's the point where I didn't know whether to be. Sort of like, you know, credit where credit's due. It is sort of, it's either a good joke that you can pull up the Exxon Valdez to a dock and go get drunk at a bar mm-hmm. by yourself. Or it's a joke that makes me want to never stop punching him in the face. I, sure. I can't decide which one it is. Okay. But that's what he does. But he says, uh, it is cold as a well digger's ass. <laughs> um <laughs> Uh, that is my dad circa I, I you was know, gonna ni- say like 1973 my dad was 
a well digger, as it turns out. <laughs> Perfect. Like, like a commercial well digger. Wow. So you've got a chance to start fights in uh, bars when someone makes that comment. Yeah. My dad was a well digger. I've heard it in a Tom Waits song. It's uh, Diamonds on My Windshield, I think. It's, uh, so it sounds very good at a Tom Waits voice. There you go. Yes. We'll have to have Tom Waits do some book reviews. As sure, that'd be do good. Some real yeah. or fanfic maybe, as well. Maybe he's a fan. Yes. <laughs> he's going to be our Patreon thing that pushes us over the uh, Bubba Gump line. Uh, anyway, so th- I just didn't, um, I don't know. Once this was set in motion, you're just like, okay, all right. Just just crash the Exxon Valdez. I, right. I, I don't have a lot of notes on this one. Uh, well, he comes on. He says, I like this part. They're talking about Wanda. For some reason, that comes up. And Forrest says she's at the National Zoo in Washington. Really doing what? In a cage. They are showing her off. Well, I'll be damned, he says. A monument to all our folly. <laughs> 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 so, so, yeah, there's a more, uh, more of that selective eruditeness. Um, but then Mr. McGin- McGiver, I think, starts drinking more. Yes. Yeah. Or he becomes and and a- then he turns into a pirate. Yeah. He says... Hootman, I think I'm about four sheets to the wind. Army buckos, we'll be 40 leagues from Portobello. Run out the guns. You'll have a bit of the animal in you, young Jim. Long John Silver's my name. What's yours? And that's so, I looked it up at this point in time because I was like, Mr. McGiver was a, you know, obviously a intentional name here, but the uh, actual captain was named Joseph Hale, Hazelwood. And so I, I looked into whether he was drunk, um, when he when he crashed the ship yeah. or ran it aground or whatever, and it's one of those things where like I'll, I'll just read you the the Wikipedia synopsis. Hopefully, Wikipedia will not betray us like they did with Larry King. Yeah. During Hazelwood's trial, Alaska state prosecutors failed to convince the jury that Hazelwood was intoxicated at the time of the grounding. By his own admission, Hazelwood drank two or three vodkas between four thirty and six thirty p.m. that same night before boarding the Exxon Valdez at eight twenty five p.m. His blood alcohol content was found to be 0.061. So that's three times the legal limit, I believe. Um, maybe No, not. really? Is it, have they lowered it that much? Uh, it oh, used I thought, to be 0. 0.08. Oh, okay. So maybe, I, I, I don't know. No, it's, it's different for every state, too. So I don't know don't what I'm think. talking about. I thought it was right. 0. 0.02. But anyway, it doesn't matter. Um, you, you're correct. However, the defense argued the blood samples were taken nearly 10 hours after the incident and were mishandled. So everything got sort of thrown out on a technicality. He had been drinking, whether he was, you know, to the point where he was intoxicated. It was, uh, <laughs> was uh, up, for, up, for, up for debate, I guess. Oh, well, you can't convict him. <laughs> yeah, I had some vodka, but, uh, you know mishandled samples who's to say yes <laughs> um but so that's you know that's that's what he's going for here he didn't want to use the guy's real name probably because uh you know parody satire all that type of thing sure uh there was a remember john denver the the late great uh yeah. s- singer actor uh he crashed an experimental plane i believe he, uh, i hope i don't get it wrong it doesn't matter either into a lake or a mountain mm-hmm. but at the time he had been uh, there. Were, there were rumors about him having problems with drugs and alcohol or whatever. Uh-huh. And well, so, sure. I mean, was, that comes through in his music. Uh, you know, yeah. it just <laughs> sounds like a Hellcat. But, but it went through the, as a rumor that he had pulled like a case of beer on on this plane. Oh, the old Wade Boggs. Yeah, and so that's the reason that he crashed. And I think I probably repeated that because it sounds. <laughs> <laughs> and I looked it up once. I'm like, it's just not not true in the least. I've been <laughs> slandering this man. <laughs> I'm not saying there wasn't, a, you know, he it, it might have been a fool. He took an experimental airplane. He didn't know where the sure. backup gas tank was, and he ended up just, like, running out of gas, even though there was, like, a gas tank behind him, which doesn't make any sense. But whatever. Anyway, he did not drag, like, a... <laughs> Got it. A case of old style between the seats and like had a, you know, was cracking them open on his lap and like, ah, this flying a plane is easy as shit. Yeah. Rocky Mountain High. <laughs> well, that's good to know. I mean, uh, no no jury would convict on that, you know, no matter what, if they heard a Thank tearful you, rendition of Follow Me in the Accord. Whew. That's a load off my mind. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> but yeah, he does run it aground and uh, that causes uh, people uh, on the boats. A hundred people running around at the bridge, everybody hollering and screaming and giving each other orders, and some of them be, even be giving each other the finger. Um, oh, I circled that and just went, go to hell. Right, yes. <laughs> That's what was happening as the band was playing on the Titanic, too. Yes. I don't know. But uh, they dumped 
Uh, 10 million gallons of crude all into Prince William Sound. Birds, seals, fish, polar bears, whales, and Eskimos all will be destroyed by what we has now done. So they sort of just uh, they they toss in the Eskimos as the uh, as the as the capper on that one as a as a fun little uh, Forrest Gumpian incident. The, millions of animals and people will die because of this uh, little uh, drunk driving incident. Well, you know, it'll be safer to walk down the streets as there will be no more uh, harpoon throwing contests. <laughs> sure, sure. <laughs> but Good then he, Lord. So then that gets a uh, that gets a headline, and then we essentially get a. Uh, a, an army guy coming back, a general who gives him the uh, samurai cop or snake and bacon police chief mm-hmm. routine. Gump, the general says, if it was up to me, I'd have you before a firing squad for this. But since it isn't, I'm going to do the next best thing, which is to have your big stupid ass transferred as far away from here as possible, which in this case is to Berlin. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, just a, a an old, an old hard ass shows up and you, you blew up. It's it, that's the old cliche. You blew up half the harbor, but he, he really did tank a harbor. <laughs> yes. Uh, anyway, good job, Forrest Gump. Right. <laughs> uh, I, it would be interesting to note if, in the case of going to, um, where did it crash, the Exxon Valdez? The Prince um, William Sound. This is one Prince... of the first things I remember as like a third grader, like the first national incidents that made headlines. Yeah, it was a huge deal. Uh, it would be interesting to see, is Berlin, Germany the farthest away <laughs> that a uh, a military guy could, uh, you know, send another military right. person to? Yeah, yeah. Eh, I just want someone to weigh in on that. Yeah, there's probably military bases in both these places to... Uh... To uh, make the ex- extradition quite fast. I don't know. But th- it needed to be a place where some wacky 80s thing was going to happen. And uh, boy, it doesn't get any wackier than Berlin in the late 80s. Yes. If anyone missed this one, <laughs> yeah, really. shape on you. <laughs> the only question is, how dumb is it going to be? And uh, I think I read ahead of you. And so we did it offline uh, is uh, you guessed what it was. And I'm like, yeah, of course, that's it. Yeah. And then you said, and he does this. I'm like, and you, whatever your guess was. And I'm like, nope. Yeah. Way, way dumber. And was I right? You were way, yeah, you were. And I got misdirected. I predicted the wrong thing. Um, so I, I but, but but then again, you could never see something like this coming because it's so, it's so stupid. <laughs> There's yes. not alluded to or based in any sort of history. So, uh, yes. Well, let's get to it. Chapter 10. Yeah. He's uh, he's sent over there to do like the grunt work as punishment. So he's cleaning um, tank treads, uh, mud off of tank treads. And he says, <laughs> I was sent to a tank company where it's my duty to clean all the mud off the tank treads. And let me say this. There is plenty of mud on the tank tracks in Germany in the winter. I, I, I didn't doubt it. Um, it <laughs> didn't really require that, uh, that double down. Uh, I think- no, I also wondered... I'm pretty sure, I, I don't know, there's probably some way to clean tank treads or something. I don't know. I didn't look it up. I'm pretty sure that tanks probably have some self-cleaning thing because otherwise... Right. What's the point? They, they, they wouldn't <laughs> run as tanks. So, yes. But anyway, all right, whatever. It's and his it, gag. I'll leave it to him. I thought that this was clumsy too. It says that word had gotten out, apparently, that I am a Jonah or something because no one wants to speak to me and all they do is holler at me. And yeah. We, we had a not two chapters ago, had a Jonah in a situation where Forrest Gump was not the Jonah. He was Goliath wearing a diaper. There was a Jonah in the whale that he wrecked the thing of. Oh, it's that's just... right. We actually had the Jonah. <laughs> wow. So it's like, God, come on now. This is, this is easily avoidable. I'm a pariah. There you go. Like, Use that word as opposed to the one that's just going to confuse people. Uh, so we get a... So this is another... We get another striptease dancer. Yeah. Uh, makes me think what what's going on with this author, the late great, uh, what's his name? Winston uh, Groom. Winston I, Groom. Is he dead? I I think he is. I okay. think we lost him. Okay. Uh, another yes. bad dad party joke. Give it. So to anyhow, the officers' club was mobbed, so as you could barely see the stripper. And at some point, the general himself got up on the table at the back of the room to get a better look. However, it seems Sergeant Krantz had installed the ceiling fans about a foot lower than normal, and when the general stands up on the table, it got him in the head, scalped him just like an Indian might do. Brother. 
<sighs> Sorry, I, I'm just quoting. <laughs> yeah, it's a bizarre. Uh, it's a. <laughs> I know. assume that that's a joke about like, you know, like uh, the the dirty version of humor in uniform or something. Like one day we hired. Seems the young private hired a stripper for the uh, for but the it, club. Yeah, but everyone. So that's a general that it said. So yes. yeah, everyone. Everyone in this is just a uh, you know a, a horny hayseed that's like eager to see the uh, Anne Margaret perform at the USO show in right. <laughs> in the sixties or something. So that's a general climbing up on a table to get a look, good look at a Australian stripper. And Margaret will be up for uh, for the next hour. <laughs> yes. We'll be talking about her accident falling off the stage. So yeah. that's some some pretty serious stuff coming up. Hear next. about her rolling grumpier old man, which I quite enjoyed. <laughs> okay. But so uh, this yeah. is a uh, is Sergeant Kranz, who was the guy that was selling him the army scraps for the. Uh, pig farm who has shown up here again because we keep running into these it's like out when a when a sitcom is in its seventh season and there's no reason that any of these people would still be like in the same college or something you have to find a yes. way to have them all come back and work at the college or something so it's doing these uh these type of needless coincidences here yeah so that's why this crans guy got busted down so he blames uh forest for it and rightfully forest goes well, i don't see how that's my fault <laughs> that you spent the money on a stripper and you, you know, misinstalled the, uh, you know, the ceiling fan a, a foot lower or something like yeah. the general. Otherwise, he knew ceiling fan height. I don't know. Right. Yeah. Anyway, this is what. Uh, so this is Kranz's reaction, though, to the whole thing. And he's in the end. He goes like, well, whatever. Forgive and forget. Anyway, seeing the fan gave that old bastard a flat top, he says. So he's kind of happy about it. Mm -hmm. and it's like. I, from your description, it scalped the general. Yes. It's... Like hours and hours of microsurgery. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, my God, did it like where Where did the fan hit him? Like in, above the eyebrows and then peel back? Like, <laughs> Yeah, really concussion, if not uh, permanent brain damage from that type of thing. Yeah. I mean... Ceiling fans don't cut your hair off and give you a flat. You described it as scalping earlier. <laughs> scalping. <laughs> So and he was lying on the floor. People were going, my God, the general, so much blood, scalp injuries bleed so much. Ah. Can we find a way for this scalping to involve a, uh, a, a the general's wife getting her to clothes torn off by a mob, perhaps? Uh, <laughs> that would be the real way to stretch this in. And then there's this weird uh, other like pathos into this whole thing, which is maybe you're supposed to know about this from the first book, but the, the uh, sergeant says... I, I mean, I, I don't think this was talked about before, but he says I was one of the first black soldiers to make it mm, to the top of mm -hmm. enlisted ranks in the in this man's army. But uh, it seems like every time I ever get around you, Gump, there is some kind of shit fixing to go on. So you get that sort of uh, this this whole wacky scenario of strippers and ceiling fans has uh, has has, <laughs> has affected this uh, this poor uh, colonel. It's quite a slam, however, on the stripper that she's not a striptease artist. Yep, right. So yeah. she's just a stripper. So I wonder what in in uh, Gump's mind, like, what is the difference? You I, know, like like a, a you know Sally Rand kind of balloon. Uh, yeah, uh, you know. if you if you bring out the fans, I mean, that's probably striptease artist as opposed to just you know coming out to uh, pour some sugar on me with the pole type of thing. Yeah, work in the pole. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I mean, who's to say what is art though? I just think it's pretty. Uh, eh, it's pretty uh, uh, nasty of him to to make that judgment. <laughs> but yeah, the best stripper in the world versus a striptease artist. I yeah, I, I in the in the community, I'm sure it's probably like blow to pop lunars versus. Uh, you know, not blow to pop. It's there's just probably a schism, and uh, they, yes. they do their own things, and then they they edit each other's wiki pages and argue that way. Thank you for you know bringing complete clarity to that situation. <laughs> Everyone now understands what you're talking about. Look, the CEO of Rift Tracks was talking about uh, how he had to <laughs> oh, tell <no>. someone <laughs> what a brony jar was the other day. So it's uh, it's oh. it's infected. It's infected every aspect of what we do here. Common denominator, you. All right. <laughs> Um, so they, uh, I, I, this is at this point, I thought that as they were scraping the mud off these things, they were going to like take a, you know, go to a dog track and forsake their work. And then a, a tank was going to accidentally crash into the wall because they hadn't cr cleaned the, the mud off the treads, but it was not that stupid. Um, it turns out that it's going to involve someone recognizing Forrest's, uh, natural football ability. They don't recognize mm -hmm. that he was an NFL star player. They just say, you're a big guy. You can probably play football. 
Um, and so he joins like the army's intramural football team who goes around and plays other, uh, other teams and bases in Germany. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, so the commander asked, asks, <laughs> sorry, uh, I understand you played a little football at one time. Is that so? <laughs> like, couldn't you then just go, yeah, I'm, I'm Forrest Gump. Remember? Yeah. Oh yeah. You went, <laughs> yep. Oh man. You went 14 and 0 yeah. and were a superstar, an absolute my, superstar. You won me my fantasy team because you were on the waiver wire in week nine. I picked you up and you had that run for the playoff. Sure. <laughs> Instead, he says, uh, tell me about it. And so I did. And when I finished, the commander says, great God almighty. Like when I said my name, surely you recognized. <laughs> Uh, I mean, it was the '90s. Who knows how uh, how they were getting their football news in, the, in that era? It was like in the that one newspaper you'd get that was an American paper that um, what I would like you know look up sports scores in when I was taking a trip to London in middle school or something. Oh, sure. <laughs> yeah. They were uh, Calvin and Hobbes. I was always impressed by that. Oh, great, great cartoon. <laughs> uh, earlier uh, thing, I just want to pull this out. I've never heard this phrase before, and I'm sure it's all on me. Is they both say it. Uh, Cran says this man. We had tanks and howitzers and bombers could sure bring down a load of pee on the enemy. Mm. I, is that a thing? Is that a Southern thing? A load of pee? <laughs> seems seems after all of that to be sort of weak. Like, yeah. you know, let's yeah, make it, let's ass base it, a load of shit. You yeah, know, really. Come on, man. Uh, it does seem, it's always funny when like a, a supposedly like hard boiled character says stuff like that, but maybe that's just his, maybe he's a, he's a button down guy. That's, that's, that's as, as dirty as he gets in this honorable position. Although we did hire the world's best stripper who probably doesn't come cheap. Yeah. He got his general scalp shredded off. So, <laughs> well, whatever. P I guess is the thing that he does. Well, all the, right. Uh, the, the fellas do go into town that no word on whether they're going to ass around or not. But they, uh, right. <laughs> they, they, they they go to be, uh, beer halls. They start brawls there, of course, um, because after a while, one of our fellers puts his hand on the ass of one of the waitresses, which, I mean, at this point in time, it just is, is if you've got to just zero in on the first ass you see, and that's going to cause some mayhem in these scenarios. Sure. <laughs> Um, and then that, that causes, of course, a, uh, a, a double deuce style riot with, uh, gouge and bite and shouting and chairs are flying and all these things. It sound he says it was just like the good old times back at Wanda's strip joint in New Orleans. And, and this is where I'm going to bring out this complaint again, and I'm sure defenders of the late, great Winston Groom will, will come after me. Forrest, uh, apparently speaks perfect German. <laughs> he does not understand it. But he can, I mean, he can ascertain what they're saying and then ascertain. he can recreate. Yeah. <laughs> Pissertain. <laughs> uh, and so he quotes the Germans who are offending them. Uh, so they are muttering stuff such as Offenarsch and Schweizbolus. <laughs> and we do not understand them. However, the spelling is perfect. Perfect, yeah. Uh, and then one of the German fellers shouts real loud, Du kannst mir mal in dein Sack fassen. I don't speak German, so that... And then, huh? Says our right tackle. <laughs> but it's all put down, like, perfectly. <laughs> Why does he just say, bunch of German crap? And they says, you know, real mean-like. Um, yeah, I... Or it's like, a cheat. It's a cheat. What is the uh, talk to a German people be like? What would a how would a you know the German version of a Southern redneck say this in your you know <laughs> yes. in your thing? And then if that was translated, you would have to tip your cat in that thing. But it seems like that is just a German phrase or something. I didn't bother putting any of them into uh, into Google Translate, but I did. They're very Winston Groomy, where the okay. insults are like maybe they're actual German insults, but they seem sort of like I don't know, sir. They, they, yeah, they seem a little off. <laughs> Not funny, but off. Sure, that's uh, pretty much, yeah. I think you could say that about this book in general. That would be our pull quote. Yes. Uh, he meets a waitress named Gretchen who works as a, at a beer hall holding the big mugs. And he does, uh, we finally, we, we get to the point of this whole thing, right? We can, we can, we can just get, mm. to the, get to the thing. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, it says, uh, we went to go play a uh, game in Berlin. And he says, it was in a big old field next to the Berlin Wall where we played the All-Army Championship game. And uh, again, I said, 
if you somehow just left this unaddressed and it was just about like a dramatic victory in the game and then they went home, I would, you know, again, tip my hat to the guy. But that is, of course, not what happens. This game somehow results in the tearing down of the Berlin Wall. The details of which are, uh, I feel like um, Groom is is slumming it here. He doesn't really... Uh, we don't get a lot of history here, unlike the rich, rich history of Ivan Boski and Michael <laughs> Mulligan uh, and uh, Colonel North. This, we, we just get a, he kicks the ball over the other side, so they hoist him over the wall and, like, go grab the ball. Yeah, the ball then, ended up in a in a, in the World Cup Finals, uh, which is happening right on the other side of the wall in East Germany. Do, did East Germany have a stadium big enough to hold the World Cup finals? Was my I, question. I sincerely doubted that, and I doubted that Russia would have been the team they were playing. However, I didn't want to get too deep into the woods. Uh, sure. My then soccer then you're in his world. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. So, um, but it also, if it's not, if it didn't happen, it doesn't seem like there's a reason that you need there to be a soccer game. And then the hooligans or the team, men, you know, chases him back across the thing, and that's what ends up tearing down the wall. It doesn't seem necessary. You could just. Uh, uh, I don't know what I would have done, but if this scenario was a, some of the other ones in the book have been sort of Rube Goldberg machines where you do this and then the pig thing explodes, et cetera, et cetera. And this one was just essentially like pushing a button that says make Berlin wall fall down. Yes. And uh, he, you know, the, the guards on the East German side, they see him running through and they're just like, I don't know why they didn't shoot me. Like, yeah, everyone's wondering that because that's pretty much <laughs> yes. what they were known for. Yes. They must've been so astonished at me. And then somehow ran into the stadium, right. which, you know, if anyone who's ever tried to run into a sports stadium and get onto the field <laughs> knows how easy that is, which right. he does. And then the entire, you know, uh, football field of people runs after him and then somehow swarms the wall. I right. was very foggy on it at that point. So. Right. And it was, it's, it's one of those literary things in the first episode when I said that, you know, the, the newspaper headlines reminded me of Homer Simpson and the, the, the headline was, you know, Idiot on field, Springfield four fifths pennant. So we finally get, you know, a, we truly do get an idiot on the field that could have that be the headline in the paper. <laughs> mm-hmm. But all the thing about the guard sh- not shooting him and stuff like that is is undermined by Gretchen, the beer hall waitress he met, who was like, "Oh, my family is over there. It's so sad. I can't get to them." And so you know, he he sort of undercuts that by just like assing back and forth uh, to to pick up his ball out of the neighbor's yard. <laughs> Yeah, the richly drawn character of Gretchen was a, <laughs> less said about that, the better. Better. She was just like holding hands with him and watching sunsets come up. Yeah. Uh, again, was she a fan of his American football career or like how did she, why did she, she pulled him out of that bar fight and just oh. went like, and then they, they had a, you know, they walked around Berlin like, all night. Yeah. yeah. I, I, that's exactly what I said. I just said you were you were a richly developed character, Gretchen, as she <laughs> as she said. I don't know what you have done for us, but I will tell you this: they are tearing down the Berlin Wall, and for the first time in thirty years, our family will not, our country will not be divided. Perhaps I can even see my family again, Ja. And uh, you know, then they, that's the last we see of her for now. You never know. Uh, Gretchen, by the way, did not speak English and suddenly was able to speak English. Sure, got so. it. <laughs> yes. The wall so. uh, made all sorts of things happen. wonder if Gretchen was a fan of schnappy. You never know. Oh, <laughs> if Forrest had invented schnappy in this. Ah, uh... oh, das kleine Krokodil. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I just, I just want to describe the antics of his, uh, what happened when he got to the soccer stadium, just to sort of show you how, how out of steam this whole sort of bit was happening. When I got into the soccer stadium, I could not immediately figure out what was going on, but it did not look good. What had happened, though, I guess he does figure it out. What had happened, though, was this. East Germany was about to score a goal and take the lead from the Russians when I kicked my football. The German player had dribbled his soccer ball downfield and was right at the Russian goalpost when my football bounced in front of him. Since he did not expect this, he became sort of confused and kicked my football right into the Russian goal instead of his soccer ball. That's what you would do if you were confused. You would kick the wrong ball. <laughs> at first, all the Germans went crazy. It counted they had scored a goal and won the game. And then it, of course, disallowed. Then there's pandemonium. And then <laughs> they chase him back out. Uh, I dropped on the other side. A bunch of angry Germans then climbed over after me and begun chasing me around our football field. Then more Germans began climbing over the wall and a bunch of others, I reckon, in an effort to get at me, begun tearing chunks out of the wall. Pretty soon it was apparent they was going to tear down the whole Berlin Wall just in order to catch me. Sure, why not? That's how it happens, etc. 
Well, and while that was happening, he heard them shouting stuff at me like, and again, don't speak German, okay. De Schwanzegesseit Scheißebola Susa. Uh, so stuff like that. <laughs> yes. Which, that was the one I plugged into. The, I have that. Okay. Uh, 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 language warning. Yep. Earmuffs for the kids. You cock-faced damn sweetheart. <laughs> So I don't know if that's German or again or uh, or Gumpian. I would have thought Scheiße ball, like shit ball. Uh, that's what I thought, but I, I don't know. I, I put that into Google because I was going to translate it. And the only thing that comes up is something called Poem Life, and it has it appears to be Chinese text in it, and it has that sentence in here. Um, I don't know if it's a like bootleg uh, site hosting the Chinese translation of Gump and Co, but it does not appear to want to load, and I'm sure it just gave my oh, okay. Computer. So that is. Ten different oh, viruses. All right, so it's only it's yeah. only Groomian. It is not German. No, no, definitely not. Yeah. Well, uh, it it ends with uh, what's his name, uh, Forrest and uh, Gretchen uh, getting it on that night. He doesn't feel guilty, and he expects Jenny to show up, but she never does. And that's where it ends, Chapter Eleven. Um, he's he's torn down the Berlin Wall. He's crashed the Exxon Valdez, and he's instigated uh, various Wall Street scandals in the eighties. And uh, we're we're left to wonder where it's going to go in the uh, in the final few chapters here. And you can tell me all you want that Larry King didn't enjoy this book. I'm sorry. I feel like it's canon that he sat back and just roared. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, loved it. Loved every minute of it. Yeah. If he if he did not physically read it, he spiritually very much did. Um, and I'd be. We should find out if Winston Groom ever did uh, appear on the talk show because that would be pretty amazing. <laughs> I feel like if we looked up right now, we would see in sort of a cloudy, foggy thing, the Larry King's desk and him hovering over it and looking down on this podcast <laughs> and giving us a nod to go, yes, keep it <laughs> a going, A sentence gentlemen. begins with a capital <laughs> letter. A capital uh, so there you go. letter is a letter let's, that's uh, big. A capital letter is not a small letter. A capital letter is big, big, big. A sentence ends All right, so these are the dumb sentences of the week. Again, many of them submitted by our beloved... Good looking, well off, destined for great things Patreon supporters. Well mannered. Yes. Punctual. Some of the yes. greatest striptease artists in the world. Artists, yes. Artists, absolutely. Yes. <laughs> uh, here's the dumb sentences. Uh, Harris submitted, right, says Mr. Squeegee. And this is uh, something we glossed over, but they're talking about which way, which side are you on? Oh like, yes, where I, do you I, dress? Yes, that's a that's a gag that I didn't even want to get into. I did yes. not. I, I I intuited what they were talking about. Which way you hang? And uh, it just is. They pointed out how clumsy it was because right is either which way you're talking about or correct. It, it was a again an, a a thirties joke or like you know are you being served type of humor. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, ben and Katie both submitted me. However, it looks like we'll be returning to jail also, but that was not to be uh, one of the least diagrammable sentences we've had in this podcast in a long time. <laughs> uh, this one is uh, submitted by Janelle. She said, for a while, it looked like I was off the hook, but of course it turned out that was wrong, which is probably the, the spiritual follow-up to that previous sentence. Yes. <laughs> uh, Janelle and her... Uh, Boyfriend Andrew got engaged in between the last episode, she said. They, uh, that oh. must be the first uh, podcast listener wedding we've ever had. We've had uh, babies born who have listened to this podcast, but not a wedding. So congrats to them. Yeah, absolutely. Congratulations. Yeah, didn't you have a a, a baby set with the lunar uh, picture on Yeah, it? there was a yeah, the baby wearing the, the rig, the rig yeah. onesie. Um, so. Yeah, your work is done here. <laughs> if... Uh, I mean, the power move would be to find that that cow and get him to officiate the wedding. I, I I I can't I can't endorse that, but I would also be very proud of you if you did that. You too. <laughs> oh, come on, you can endorse that. Go ahead. Uh, well, I mean, I'm not going to like give them the money to to hire the guy and fly him out there, but I I, well, yeah, I certainly a... endorse it. Yes. I mean, yeah, okay. There if we if go. I went to a wedding and that happened, though, I'd be like, come on, <laughs> like <laughs> I, I, I'm keeping the uh, the uh, the air fryer I bought you if you're making me sit through a, a rig wedding. <laughs> <laughs> but i mean hopefully it, it remains small and internet uh, intimate and and uh and far from the uh far from the interstate as as we've learned as the is the proper way to do a wedding god i hope so oh yeah. my god i never even thought of that what yeah. if they have a large wedding you sound panicked i, I don't know what to do <laughs> 
Uh, Harrison submitted over at our table, Ivan Bozowski and Mike Milligan are grinning like Cheshire cats. We touched on that, but it's uh, delightful to see. Mike submitted Woody Allen arrives with a whole entourage, as does the writers Kurt Vonnegut and Norman Mailer and Robert Ludlum. And he points out sort of what you did. Uh, at this point, it's too much if the narrator is going to use the word entourage. Spell it correctly, not to mention spell the names Vonnegut, Mailer, and Ludlum. Then God damn it, put the D at the end of and so we can read the book like it's a damn book. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so I might have just read that wrong, but it was Norman Mailer and Robert Ludlum. Oh, God. <laughs> Uh, Craig uh, submitted people be g- people be poking and gouging and biting and shouting. Uh, and he said, again, nine words long, seven of them misspelled into Forrest Gump speak. And that doesn't include the grammatical errors. That sentence didn't happen by accident. Groom had to have spent a lot of time crafting it into something this truly awful. Uh, I think I- um, Kid Rock could turn that into a song. Don't yeah. You think? <laughs> People biting, gouging, and biting funny <laughs> things and shouting funny things. Uh, mine, uh, here's one that we uh, did not use. It was, oh, I forget what sentence it was, but it pretty much sums up the book. It is something to do with shit, our feller says. Um, <laughs> which, yeah, that uh, it sums up the book to, quite to a T at this point in time. I'm afraid I don't. I don't have any dumb sentences. Wow. I think I just kind of forgot. Sure. But then, you know, they, they kind of get burnt and stuff. So. <laughs> um, well, let's uh, let's read some emails before we, we wrap up. The, uh, this- we ain't going to the game. We ain't going to the game. We ain't going to the game. We ain't going to cruise out, man. Uh, I tried to look up whether we had any Fax King things about Alaska since we brought that up. It doesn't appear that there's like a list of fax kings about states, which I am just disappointed by. Uh, but if you type Alaska into the search box on fax thing, fax king, the second thing that pops up is t- eight top predators of sea otters that eat sea otter. <laughs> <laughs> so it sounds very much like your Dewey Cheatham and Howe merchandise. Dewey, these are the top 10 things that eats. Wow. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, all right. Number one, uh, as you might expect, well, humans. Um, I don't know if Tumis are eating a lot of sea otters. Number two, coyotes. Hmm, really? Oh, <laughs> really? <laughs> the coyotes belong to the dog family and once lived mainly in deserts and prairies. Today, they roam the American continents, mountains, and forests. They have even managed to colonize cities such as Los Angeles. <laughs> uh, such as seals. Exactly. Uh, and so let's get on with our emails. No time left to spend on Fax King. If you do find any good Fax King uh, facts about Alaska, please let us know. Yeah. Uh, uh, here are our emails. Uh, number one is, uh, all right, we, we knew we were going to get some of these, but the, the, Forrest, uh, the Gump and Company defenders have logged on. This is from Joni. They say, I, I, I unironically love Gump and Co. Reading it for the podcast is probably my fifth time going through it. Maybe it's the silly, ironic tone, the amusing Finnish translation, or just my nostalgia, but reading it always gives me a goofy grin and a few dumb chuckles. I like the first book a lot, but the sequel's over-the-topness is way more up my alley. Okay. The Finnish <laughs> translation? They're reading the Finnish translation. I think Joni is in Finland, so... Uh, I, can't, <clears throat> I can't fault you then. Then I 100%. It's like, fine. Maybe that improves the book. That's true. Who knows? Yeah. I mean, you know, I I think they say they still laugh at the ass jokes, the childish slapstick, and the mockery of 80s politics. Is there really a lot of 80s politics mockery going on? Maybe I'm still spiritually in high school. Keep up the good work. Love the pod. So, hey, you know, it's uh, if it brings you back to a to a happier time, that's uh, or relieve some stress. You know, what, what are we going to do? There are there are our worst books to to log on and defend. I, I'd rather talk to someone who defends this book than someone who defends Ready Player One. Yeah, well, we've said that from the beginning. Like, if you like it, you like it. I don't. Yeah, yeah. I don't have any. This one's easier to understand. That. I don't know. At least, it, yeah. at least you can picture Tom Hanks in the role. Uh, this next email is from Brad. <laughs> this is good. My 18-year-old college-bound daughter noticed I was reading Gump and Co. the other day. She asked me, "Is that like the Bubba Gump Shrimp Factory?" And I responded, "Well, yeah, it's Forrest Gump, which is where Bubba Gump comes from." To which she said, "In 100% serious." Miss, I don't know who that is. <laughs> so Brad's daughter was just out there uh, thinking there was a chain of restaurants with a peculiar name, Bubba Gump Shrimp Company, not bothering to wonder why they were around. <laughs> wow. That's like you're in the middle of the uh, Wings concert and you go, 
And, and, and how do you like Paul McCartney? I don't know who that is. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, uh, I think, you know, I think Sean once said, like, there's, there's going to be, I mean, this was before, before this became impossible, but he was like, there's just going to be a whole generation of kids who, who don't know, who don't know why the guy is always holding up the big pants in the subway ad. <laughs> like, like, why is this? <laughs> they weren't right. going to understand that that was a, they had a story as to why that guy, that odd looking pervert became their sponsor. But uh, um, this next email is from Dan. He said, oh, yeah, that was the one who uh, let us in that uh, Larry King had not read it. Uh, this one's from Steve. He says, today's Gump and Cump trivia. Not really a fan of how that has caught on, but I guess it is catchy. It sounds like a, a regional chain of, of convenience stores, right? Don't you have some odd named ones out by you? Uh, we have the Pump and Munch, <laughs> which That's I used to I live thought. near. Yeah. Very much did not like that. Yeah, yeah. but come and go. Like yeah, they're yeah, all, yeah. they're just awful. Yes, yeah, it fits right in. He says, today's Gump and Cump trivia. Among the victims of Bernie Madoff were Eric Roth, the screenwriter of Forrest Gump's, and, you guessed it, Larry King. It all ties together. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, all right, you know, Dan tries to take Larry away from us, and Steve giveth it right back. <laughs> Thank you, wow. sir. Yes. Yes. <laughs> wow, how much do I have left? Uh-huh. I see. Nothing. Okay. <laughs> our next Courtney Thornsmith on our next half hour. <laughs> yes. Uh, then we have uh, we have one. Uh, this this came up, uh, I think, right before we met Mr. Squeegee and discerned which way he was hanging. Uh, there was a bidet joking scene, and Colin said, "I cannot believe that with all the talk about asses throughout the book, Mr. Groom didn't take the opportunity that he presented to himself to explain how a bidet works. Baffling, or even do a screwing it up type of thing. Turn it on, the bidet floods. That's what makes. Uh, I don't know. That's what causes." some other New York scandal to happen. I don't know. Yeah. I thought of the same thing in the little, I I hate to get, I mean, but look, we're talking bidets. So here we go. What was the, the doorknob was going to hit him on his, what? Little Right on his asshole. Yeah. It just seemed like the bidet Mm -hmm. was going to hit him right on his Mm -hmm. little asshole. Right. Especially since he needs to pee. That's a catchphrase. He pees in the bidet. I don't know. (laughs) <laughs> yeah. Anyway, opportunity missed. So I, I agree with the uh, with the writer. Good. Uh, and this last email is from Brad. <laughs> we always appreciate the the callbacks to future to past books we've read because it just gives um, me more heart knowing that there are other people out here whose brains are poisoned this way that ours are, where you see a connection and it makes you think of a book we read on here three years ago. <laughs> he says, "I'm starting to wonder if one of the writers for the Law and Order organized crime TV show is a 372 pages follower." It all started last year when a major series plot line that lasted months involved a sex trafficking Albanian gang that drove the girls around in vans. <laughs> he said, I chalked it up to just being a coincidence. But then in last week's episode, the main antagonist turns out to be a hit woman named Belladonna, like the Belladonna from uh, Model Land. And then he says, maybe we will know for certain if next season involves a plot line where Elliot, I guess that's the character, enlists some local quilters to stop a drug cartel. <laughs> Which, you know, you know, prove Brad Wright, writer of uh, Law & Order Organized Crime TV. You can... You can send us an anonymous email and and out yourself if that's a correct theory. I guess I have to, uh, a new series to watch, I guess. uh, See if I can uh, put the threads together myself. (laughs) Yeah, blink twice. uh, Give us a a Bleriana, if uh, the the character name, not the act, um, if you're out there uh, writing for Law and Order Organized Crime. Uh, Not the act. (laughs) Speaking of the day, sure, exactly. <laughs> it's a name. It's a it's a noun or a verb. I think yes, and it could be two different verbs because to get bleary honored means your your plot thread is left on on uh, unsolved at the end of a book. But to to pull a bleary on a is to to uh, sure u- utilize the bucket. So right, right. <laughs> hey, my uh, if my my dear uncle were still alive, the one who left me the buckets of his own yes he would lo- he would love Bleriana. yeah it's a uh just a, a folks a folksyism uh, guy's got to go pull a Bleriana, on mike that's all <laughs> all this is going to be yours one day when you're done assing around at that at that uh, in the big city and want to move back here i sent you that totem pole 20 years ago come on <laughs> well i think that's it unless you've got anything else to add 
I don't. I'm looking forward to it. I, it looks like we might have two more readings. Okay. I think it's better to do two short ones than to, you know, just to get to the end of the book and have to, to have gone too long and, um, and rush through it. Yeah, especially since, you know, then like letters will have built up and people yep. have stuff to say. So it'd be yep. fun to do that. Yeah. All right. Okay, so we'll figure great. we'll figure out the readings. But uh, thank you, everyone. Yep. Thank you. Thank you, Patreon supporters. We'll do a meme contest there. So get those ideas going. And, uh, you know, we're, we're one more away, I think, from me having to try a second soda and uh, 11 from from Mike going to the Gump and uh, Bubba Gump Shrimp Company, which uh, <laughs> which Brad's wife has no idea what what it is. Maybe a. Uh, We'll, we'll be sure to send her some we'll ask her for some recommendations since she's obviously quite familiar with the restaurant but has no idea what the book is it's like you and kiss documentaries yes well it's against my own interest but i will say uh the patreon extra of me with my story uh i i can't say enough about it okay, okay. <laughs> <laughs> thank you thank you everyone thanks for listening thanks patreon people mike bye Nelson. connor let see you next time